Welcome everyone and thank you for participating in the December 2022 meeting of the Federal Interagency Committee on Emergency Medical Services or FICOMS. I'm Jonathan Green and I serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Preparedness Response and also the Director of Operations and Resources at the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. It is also my esteemed privilege to also serve as the FICOMS Chair and Moderator for this meeting. I now call this general meeting of the FICOMS 2022 session to order. We have a full agenda today, and during today's meeting, we'll hear pro we will hear program and project updates from the FICOMS member agency representatives, from the subgroups of the technical working group, and from the NIT NHTSA Office of EMS, and from the National EMS Advisory Council. We also have guest speakers from the San Antonio EMS Whole Blood Program and from the Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Project. After that, we'll open the meeting up for a five minute period of public comment. After the period of public comment, I'll open the floor for a committee roundtable discussion of emerging EMS issues. We will now begin the meeting with introductions from each of the FICOMS representatives. I will call out the name of our constituent departments and give each representative an opportunity to provide an introduction. Please provide your name, title, and agency you represent. I'll start with the Department of Defense. Hearing none, the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Service Administration. Hello, this is Teresa Morrison Pinata. I am the branch chief with the Emergency Medical Services for Children. I represent HRSA today. Thank you. Thank you, T. And I'll be representing the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. There are representative from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Hearing none, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is Captain Skip Payne from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I'm the Director of Emergency Preparedness and Response Operations. Thank you. Thank you, Skip. The Indian Health Service is currently vacant. Moving to our colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of Health Security. Yes, good afternoon all. This is Cameron Hamilton, the Director of EMS at the Office of Health Security. Thank you and moving to the United States Fire Administration. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rick Patrick. I'm the director of national fire programs at the United States fire administration. Thank you. Thanks Rick. Moving to our colleagues at the federal communications commission. If I can get the technology to work. There we go. Hi, uh, this is David Firth. I am the deputy bureau chief of the public safety and homeland security bureau at the FCC and glad to be here. Thank you. Hi, David, thank you. And moving to the Department of Transportation. Andhra Srinivasan, representing the Office of Emergency Medical Services. Uh, I also have our uh, acting administrator, Ann Carlson. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that after the roll call is completed. Thank you. Thank you. State EMS Director Representative. Hi, my name is Steve McCoy. I'm a State EMS Director for the state of Florida and representing the State EMS Directors. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all for your introduction and attendance here today. Once again, for the members of the public joining us virtually, we have set aside five minutes of the meeting to hear public comment. Public feedback already submitted in advance via FICOMS at DOT.gov will be heard first. For those wishing to do so, the chat feature below, the meeting streaming interface may be used to submit public comment. However, it must be done at least five minutes before the com public comment period begins we will address as much of the feedback as time permits. A written response will be generated for all questions and posted to the FICOMS page on ems.gov at a later time. Now, moving on with the first item of business. Review of the June 2022 meeting summary and the approval of our June 2022 meeting summary. Uh, thank you, Chairman Green. Before I uh, address the meeting summary, I just want to hand things quickly back over to uh, Associate Administrator uh, Nandeshwini Vasan. 
Uh, thank you, thank you, Gam. Uh, as I was saying, uh, I have the acting acting administrator of NHTSA, uh, uh, Anne Carlson, with us today. Anne uh, uh, oversees the nation's vehicle safety agency, which is NHTSA, and sets vehicle standards, identifies safety defects, manages recalls, administers hundreds of millions of dollars in grants to state highway state of, uh, officers, educates Americans to help them drive, ride, and walk safely. Uh, I am personally delighted to have Anne. She previously served as as uh, NHTSA's chief counsel, uh, NHTSA's chief counsel, where she played a critical role in advancing the agency's safety mission. Uh, she has been a long, uh, a big fan of the EMS community, as you will hear from her, and uh, we are glad to have her here. Anne, thanks so much, Nanda. Good afternoon, everyone, and I appreciate the chance to speak briefly about NHTSA's work to support our EMS clinicians. I also want to thank everyone in the EMS community for your continued service, especially after what have been, I know, very trying and challenging years. You really are essential. I'd also like to thank our federal partners for your continued work as members of FICOMS. Collaboration and coordination among federal agencies are important to provide our state, territorial, tribal, and local partners with the support they need to succeed. Additionally, thank you to Jonathan Green for your dynamic leadership as chair of FICOMS. Post-crash care is a priority for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and for Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. It's one of the five key objectives of the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Roadway Safety Strategy. The demand for post-crash care, as you know, is great. EMS treated about 165,000 seriously injured crash patients in 2021. Sadly, we know that 40% of people who succumbed to their crash injuries initially survived the crash meaning that timely, quality EMS care is absolutely vital to saving lives. That's why supporting improvements to post-crash care is a top priority for DOT, for NHTSA, and for our Office of EMS. As part of our work, we recently solicited input from, M from N M NEMSAC, the National EMS Advisory Council, on how to improve post-crash care. NEMSAC responded to both NHTSA and FICOMS with several key points. First, they highlighted the importance of collaboration among highway safety officials, EMS, 911, and trauma systems. They also encouraged adopting best practices, including those for NEMSIS, emergency medical dispatch, and field trauma triage. And finally, they expressed support for continuous quality improvement programs and other initiatives. We will be taking a close look at NEMSAC's advice. I appreciate that NEMSAC emphasized the importance of collaboration we cannot save lives by working in silos. It takes everyone at all levels working in close coordination to make meaningful change. In that spirit, NHTSA is joining our federal partners to address st several specific challenges we've heard from the EMS community. Many have expressed concern about the prolonged production time on new ambulances, which can be as long as 24 to 36 months from order to delivery. A three-year wait for a new ambulance is not acceptable. U.S. DOT's leadership is engaged and the White House National Economic Council has the lead. The White House has had discussions on this issue with a number of vehicle manufacturers, and we will all continue to push vehicle manufacturers to address this concern. We've also heard from the EMS community about your workforce challenges. NHTSA recently awarded the National Volunteer Fire Council a project to support EMS volunteer recruitment and retention. We're interested in hearing from you about other ways we can bolster the EMS workforce as well as education and training. Thank you again for all you do to support your communities and save lives. NHTSA and our Office of EMS are here to help in any way we can. Chair Green, thank you again, and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Gam, please go ahead. Thank you, Chairman Green. Uh, so the Office of EMS has uh, reviewed the meeting summary, and we found that it accurately reflects the June of 2022 meeting proceedings. Does the committee concur uh, that there are no corrections necessary? And if so, all of those in favor of approving the meeting summary, signify unmute and signify by saying aye. 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 Opposition unmute and say nay. I hear no nays. Any abstentions? Based on my count, the motion passes. Thank you. 
We'll now hear updates from the FICOMS representatives. For updates, I'll call on the agency or administration. When you hear your name or the, of the agency, please provide your update. If you do not have an update, please advise and I'll move on to the next. We'll start off with the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. Hello, uh, Mr. Green, can you hear me? I can. Oh, great, great. I apologize, I was having technical difficulty earlier. I'm Elizabeth Budge and uh, I, uh, I'm the Executive Officer in uh, the Office of uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. And I, we usually invite our service leads who are uh, engaged in our emergency medical services uh, to provide an update. And I'd like to just check to see if um, uh, the Army representative is online, uh, Colonel Smith. Yes, ma'am, Colonel Smith's here and ready to deliver. Awesome, so, go ahead, sir. Great, yeah, so Colonel Will Smith, Medical Director for the Army EMS Program Officer part of the Army Office of the Surgeon General G34 Mission Assurance Program uh, on behalf of Mr. Ross and the rest of my colleagues. We are continuing to work with joint EMS protocols with the Air Force. So working across installations, doing best practices with protocol development and implementation, just when people are moving between different installations that the uh, EMS protocols and uh, delivery of care remains consistent. Uh, we've also implemented a whole blood program at Port Hunter Liggett out in California, one of our more remote uh, treatment and training areas. And so we've had one administration to date. And as far as we know, first uh, whole blood in the continental US states on the Army EMS program office and in California. So with that, I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colonel. Um, is uh, the Navy online, please, Mr. Moore? Yes, ma'am, I am. Awesome. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, in the Navy, we are, we are focusing on um, a, a lot of the core aspects, uh, protocols, med direction, and uh, uh, logistics as well. But I did want to highlight four areas that um, are maybe a little different that, that we're working on that uh, may be of interest. The first is we're enhancing provider safety. And that is by providing ballistic protection to our field providers, uh, both uh, firefighter EMTs and firefighter paramedics for use during a wide range of events, active shooter, uh, domestic disturbances, et cetera. In line with that, we're also uh, enhancing employee safety. And this is a public access emergency equipment uh, concept and what we're doing is we're uh, co-locating uh, public access AEDs along with public access uh, bleeding control kits as well as uh, fire extinguishers and facilities throughout the Navy. The idea being is that um, the AED, PAD AED programs were well in place. The uh, bleeding control or stop the bleed uh, kits um, are being rolled out. And uh, we've incorporated stop the bleed training into our regular CPR AED training for uh, employees at our various installations. So uh, we'll hope to have more to report on that in the future. In addition, we're revisiting our uh, SARS COV-2 uh, uh, SOPs, trying to capture lessons learned from that, and um, then develop uh, specific procedures and protocols. And lastly, um, and I think the Army just kind of mentioned this, um, we are modifying our program oversight model to one of an integrated public safety model. And this is where we are incorporating our uh, program assessments in with uh, Naval Security and uh, Navy Emergency Management and kind of take a, a whole approach to public safety model and uh, how well they integrate and also uh, assessing them in that model. Ma'am, that's all I have. I'm standing by for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Moore. I appreciate it. Um, I uh, am searching for Senior Master Sergeant Ed Crow. Are you online for the Air Force? Yes, ma'am. This is the Senior Master Sergeant Ed Crow. Uh, thank you for the time. I am uh, new to the position here. I've been uh, here in Falls Church, Virginia for about two months and uh, looking forward to, to continuing to represent Air Force equities across the enterprise um, at all levels. 
So just a couple of quick updates. Um, as my colleague uh, Colonel Smith mentioned, we're deliberately continuing to develop the joint pre-hospital emergency care protocol and standardized processes, uh, particularly between us and the Army and in discussions perhaps with the Navy in the future. Um, we're also working on an electronic patient care reporting system that is uh, part of the um, system called BatDoc. So it's the Android-enabled app that was developed by the Air Force Research Lab. Uh, and BatDoc stands for Battlefield Assisted Trauma Distributed Operations Kit. And that was actually recently adopted by the Joint Operational Medicine Information Systems um, Office as the standard uh, for pre-hospital and en route documentation across the DOD um, and DOD, DOD operations. So we're working with the Air Force Research Lab now to develop a EMS reporting uh, platform within BatDoc, which will help us more seamlessly field that uh, across the operational enterprise while uh, also capitalizing on the ability of uh, active duty medics and other base entities uh, and firefighters using that for pre-hospital EMS documentation. Uh, and then the final project we're working right now is we have a small innovation and business research grant uh, with a company called Simex um, that is helping us build uh, pre-hospital EMS scenarios into virtual reality environments. Um, again, we have had a, a lot of success in the past using this on the operational side um, to help train our uh, pre-hospital role one medics. And so now we're starting to adapt that, adapt the scenarios and the technology to also apply to our EMS providers in the field. Um, that is all I have at this time, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate the time you've given me. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, uh, CMR Stone Crow. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, welcome to the NCR. Glad to have you with us. Uh, sir, I'm going to turn that back over to you. Uh, that'll be all for DOD. Thank you. Turning now to Health Resources and Service Administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a few updates for the committee, uh, for the FICOMS members. Um, and I've included a select updates and messages from HRSA, as well as other HHS agencies to ensure each of you are aware. I cross over into some of the federal partners who work. I hope you appreciate that I've included here as part of the update uh, and that I've not stepped in your lane. So um, the first is our federal partner, ASPR, related to pediatric surge resources, considering our current environment. Um, the, ASPERS Technical Resource Assistance Center and Information Exchange, also known as TRACY, now provides a website to respond to the pediatric surge in viral respiratory illnesses impacting hospital capacity. It provides a healthcare emergency preparedness information gateway to meet the information and technical assistance needs of regional ASPERS staff, healthcare coalitions, healthcare entities, uh, providers, emergency managers, public health practitioners, practitioners and such, working in disaster medicine, healthcare system preparedness, and public health emergency preparedness. It includes a, res a resource library, an assistance center, and an information exchange, which allows users to engage in a peer-to-peer -peer discussion board for near real-time engagement. You can easily find these pediatric surge resources on ASPR's Tracy website, or you can simply Google pediatric surge resources. From uh, HHS, we are seeking help to spread the word about vaccine boosters as we approach the holiday season. A set of tools for healthcare providers to increase public confidence in COVID-19 vaccines to protect the community by encouraging individuals to get up to get updated vac COVID vaccines, Re uh, resources are available on the WeCanDoThis.hhs.gov website. I encourage members to please visit that. It's open enrollment time across the nation. Please help us to spread the word about health insurance to help us reach those in our community. This message is actually from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They have a collection of tools for helping individuals and families get health insurance. 
during the marketplace open enrollment. It's from began in November, on November 1st and ends on January 15th, so it's just around the corner. More information on how to spread the word and reach your communities will be provided in the link after this update. From HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau, the Emergency Medical Services for Children program is launching uh, its annual EMSC program survey in partnership with the EMSC Data Center. It will be sent to all EMS agencies. It's a brief survey. It takes about six minutes on average to complete. Uh, the focus to us is to assess whether EMS agencies have a pediatric emergency care coordinator and a pediatric skills check process in place. In light of recent events and HRSA's ongoing support and drive to integrate pediatrics, this survey helps us to gauge how we are doing and where resources should be dedicated to advance pediatric improvements within the EMS system. This afternoon, as part of their presentation on EMS national activities, Dr. Kate Remick and Dr. Hillary Hughes will share the 2022 results, and they'll walk you a, a bit through that. Also in partnership with the EMS in, EMSC Innovation and Improvement Center, HRSA will launch the Emergency Department Screening and Treatment Options for Pediatric Suicide Quality Improvement Collaborative in January of 2023. The purpose is to drive improvement in ED screening and treatment options for pediatric suicide by optimizing the clinical care processes for children and adolescents presenting to the emergency department with acute suicidality. More information again will, and the link will be shared and as, as well as through this recording. HRSA EMSC also anticipates issuing new grants to successful states and accredited schools of medicine that applied for the state partnership funding program just recently. Awards will be issued by or before April 1st. These funds support the expansion and improvement of emergency medical services systems for severely ill and injured children. One grant per state uh, is issued each, each year. I think that's it for our updates and uh, thank you fellow federal partners for the opportunity. Back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks T, I appreciate it. Um, and I'll just uh, relate a couple of additional things from the administration for strategic preparedness and response. Thank you T for a uh, shout out for Asper Tracy, always appreciated. And for folks that haven't seen the, uh, the resource, it, it, it provides a lot of information about a large number of uh, topics of interest across the healthcare spectrum, including emergency medical services. Um, I had the pleasure last week of attending the Healthcare Coalition Conference in Anaheim, California, where EMS was um, heavily uh, present. Uh, and uh, it just exemplifies the progress or the interest that the Healthcare Preparedness Program and others have placed on including uh, EMS as part of healthcare and engaging them in creative solutions to problems in health systems around the country in improving health uh, system performance and the ability to provide patient care to those in need. Um, I, we will continue to work with the HPP program to find other ways to uh, incorporate EMS, involve EMS, working creatively to help um, the, that, that grant program more uh, adequately represent the, the needs and requirements in the EMS community. So stand by for that. Um, similarly, uh, our other program offices involved in disaster preparedness and response um, have embraced uh, EMS as a valuable partner uh, and as a integral part of the emergency support function eight health and medical uh, and we rely on them uh, for a, a great deal of uh, work um, in our federal response throughout the pandemic and up to this present day. So I appreciate uh, the collaboration with the EMS community and look forward to um, many years of continued collaboration and support. Moving on uh, for updates from, uh, I know that the agency represented position is vacant for the Indian Health Service, but uh, opening the floor for anyone from IHS who may be on who has any information that they would like to share from the agency. Hearing none, we'll move on to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I don't know if Chris Cosmos was able to join today. Hearing not, we'll turn to Skip Payne from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Thank you, Mr. Green. 
So I'm Captain Skip Payne, for, uh, the Director of Emergency Preparedness and Response Operations from CMS. A uh, recent surge in influenza and RSV cases exacerbate an already difficult position for the healthcare and public health sector. Um, we continue um, at CMS, um, we continue to encourage the use of COVID-19 PHE waivers where necessary to address the evolving needs of patients and providers during the ongoing effects of the pandemic. We have also been working to provide our healthcare system. Oops, one quick second, sorry. Uh, our healthcare system um, with uh, flexible, or I'm sorry, helping them to assist in the unwinding, I, I wrote a mouthful here, and returning to regular operations after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we continue to review all the flexibilities put in place throughout the public health emergency uh, to assess the appropriateness of continuing those flexibilities beyond the public health emergency and to identify those flexibilities that should uh, potentially be made permanent. This ongoing assessment consider considers many factors, including our statutory authority, impact on health and safety, risk to program integrity, and budget impacts. When CMS identifies uh, flexibilities, um, it is no longer necessary during the phase of the pandemic. Uh, we have issued updated regulations and program guidance, and we work with providers to ensure they receive adequate notice and direction before the changes take place. I, I do wanna note here that the department continues to commit to providing a 60 day notice before terminating uh, the public health emergency uh, declaration. From our Medicare ground ambulance data collection system, it's a busy time of year for those selected ground ambulance organizations. Year one and year two organizations are collecting information over a continuous 12 month data collection period, um, which began in 2022 and they'll, they'll report out on that within five months after the organization data collection period ends. Organizations may choose to collect information over either the calendar year or their organization's fiscal year. Many organizations have fiscal years that coincide with uh, the calendar. So starting January 1, most one year and two year organizations will already have 11 months into their data or already be 11 months into their data collection periods. Beginning in 2023, select ground ambulance organizations will start reporting data to CMS using a web-based portal that is currently under development. CMS has posted on our website several helpful materials, including a user guide, frequently asked questions, and a document that will help you gain access to the CMS portal. If you have more questions about Medicare ground ambulance data collection system timelines, there are several examples of data collection periods and data reporting periods for year one and year two organizations in that frequently asked questions document on that uh, Medicare ground ambulance collection system website or on the ambulance service center website. Uh, we've also posted on our website the lists of year three and year four selected ground ambulance organizations. These organizations will receive notification letter via email and regular mail uh, from their Medicare administrative contract or MAC uh, during December. Uh, finally, we'll be holding two webinars, one for data submitters, which is tomorrow, and one for data certifiers on December 15th. Please go to our upcoming events page on our website to register, and that's cms.gov slash Medicare slash ambulance hyphen fee hyphen schedule hyphen zip hyphen code hyphen files slash ambulance hyphen events. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Payne. And now turning to the DHS Office of Health Security. Cameron, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Yes, good afternoon. This is Cameron Hamilton again. Sorry, having some technical issues here online. My apologies. Once again, my name is Cameron Hamilton, the Director of BMS at the Department of Homeland Security. I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the members that are here and for the general public that are listening in. The DHS EMS system is the second largest federal agency EMS system and is nationally aligned and operationally diverse in managing medical direction, standardization, and support to over 3,700 providers across the department. These providers provide care at a various levels of skill sets, such as EMT all the way up to paramedic and beyond those levels. Throughout the various components, DHS engages in workforce protection, emergency medical services, care for its employees, as well as those the department engages in within its mission space. 
the DHS EMS healthcare providers and workforce are employed in rural, urban, tactical, and austere conditions throughout the various department and also subcomponent missions. The DHS workforce, again, as stated, is highly scalable and able to respond to natural disasters, uh, NSSEs, national specialty, or nationally significant special events or national security special events, international requests for aids and assistance, and also as a part of a various department or agency specific operation. To effectively meet these needs, the department, which is broken down through many various federal agencies, all with very unique and nuanced missions, operates under an effective one DHS EMS system, that strategic framework furthering the efforts of the department as a whole. The DHS EMS system engages in medical oversight, quality improvement, and manages measures in place so that as to improve our EMS practices and training consistent with industry and national standards. Ultimately, we operate under the medical direction of the chief medical officer, especially here as public health oversight and medical authorities of the department. The newly formed Office of Health Security is one such office as specifically assigned and designed to, to render those authorities and oversight of department missions and respective component programs. The principal objectives of our DHS EMS system are for the improvement of medical outcomes by those receiving care, conforming to the national model of state governed EMS programs, providing medical oversight and standardization, and to represent DHS to both federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, stakeholders on first responder and EMS related matters. As already stated, the Office of Health Security, specifically the Emergency Medical Services Division, sets forth consultation and establishes component requirements for oversight in accordance with traditional industry standards approved by the Chief Medical Officer. We validate our acceptable medical standards based upon certification requirements and traditional standards used by industry as well as other federal agencies. <clears throat> Again, these emergency medical services providers span a, a range of healthcare and operational resources and use from the EMS emergency medical responder skill set all the way up to paramedic or beyond, such as our austere paramedic. We are also in the process of standardizing seven expanded scope modules, which are effectively intra qualification specialties that don't quite capture the nuances or specifics of the scope of practice traditionally accepted by EMR, EMT. AEMT and paramedic. Uh, these expanded scope modules are undergoing a standardization effort, such as advanced wound care, clinical medicine, canine care, hazmat, seaburn medical response, austere paramedicine, among others as well. Lastly, as a part of our effort to improve our overall ability to provide care, DHS is partnering with strategic facilities, trauma centers, and academic institutions to deliver EMS immersion training under project cadence to our pre-hospital providers. This is part of a critical DHS quality assurance, quality improvement process to ensure that our providers are continually meeting and exceeding industry standards. The best way to do so is by training those that they work with alongside who do this on a regular basis in a much more comprehensive fashion. So by learning and by attending these seminars and training events, our DHS EMS workforce enables itself to be more appropriately trained and aligned to traditional and acceptable industry standards of emergency medical services. We're also partnering with some institutions to designate centers of excellence so that we can ensure that we continue these key partnerships. Lastly, DHS is preparing for a federated portability of medical licensure, effectively authorizing and privileging our pre-hospital providers to practice across state lines in accordance with our respective mission and duties that the department's assigned. Uh, these used in accordance with national protocols established under a singular scope of practice or commonly accepted scopes of practice for each specialty skill set are another effort that we use at DHS to standardize our practices and efforts. Mr. Chair, thank you for your time. Let me turn it back over. Thank you, Cameron. Appreciate it. Turning now to the United States Fire Administration. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, great to see uh, at least those of you that have your cameras on, I guess, uh, within the uh, this environment. But as I stated earlier, I'm Rick Patrick. I'm the director of the National Fire Programs Division at the U.S. Fire Administration and representing uh, Dr. Lori Moore Merrill, the United States Fire Administrator. Um, thanks for having us and for uh, participating. I wanted to, to point out that uh, the vision of the U.S. Fire Administration is a prepared and resilient fire and emergency medical services. Um, with that being said, you know, our mission focus is 
that we support and strengthen fire and EMS and stakeholders to prepare for, prevent, mitigate, and respond to all hazards. Um, this is published on our website and throughout FEMA and, and other uh, DHS um, entities for that. And that being said, um, probably one of the biggest updates uh, that I'd like to share with you today is our intent uh, in a reorganization led by Dr. Uh, Moore Merrill uh, to add an EMS branch within the U.S. Fire Administration. Uh, and should everything fall in alignment here in the early part of uh, 2023, we will be standing up a formal EMS branch in the National Fire Programs Division. Uh, the National Fire Programs Division will be uh, retitled as National Fire and EMS Programs Division um, with that. And we will be building out a, a comprehensive uh, EMS branch to support the vision and mission statement that I just made. Um, in some updates related to that, uh, you may recall during our last meeting, I did make reference to the uh, conducting a complete EMS gap analysis that uh, has been underway now for a little over six months. Uh, this is a contract being done to better understand what is missing within the realm of our mission and statutory scope. Uh, as charged by Congress as it relates to emergency medical services. And from there, we will work to build out what our strategic uh, plan and uh, engagement will be going forward. Uh, this is critical to FICOMS. You know, as the USFA is called out statutorily to be part of FICOMS uh, and to enhance the collaboration with FICOMS and all of our federal partners uh, to ultimately benefit the, bo benefit the boots on the street, um, the stakeholders, uh, in preventing incidents, uh, if we can, from occurring in the first place to protecting our responders um, when they do have to respond. In addition to that, um, we will focus uh, with a lot of effort uh, on FEMA. We have heard stakeholders for many years um, reference the lack of EMS engagement within the disaster preparedness planning and response phases uh, of that. And we, we tend to, uh, I'm sorry, intend to be um, uh, instrumental uh, if not orchestrating uh, that further engagement as we go forward. Um, coupled with that, uh, our Federal Fire Working Group that uh, some of you may be aware of, this is also a statutory charge under the U.S. Fire Administration and led by us. Uh, you can relate it similar to what we're doing right now with FICOMS, but uh, here at the USFA, all the federal partners that are involved in fire or some type of uh, fire threat or consequence of fire uh, are engaged in regular meetings to discuss collaborative efforts um, along that and how that relates to, to EMS and health and medical impacts. Uh, just to give you an example, a specific to like smoke, combusted, combustion chemicals, uh, and those impacts on the general public as well as uh, the first responder community. And that's just a high level um, uh, aspect of that. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we are uh, enhancing our collaboration with DHS Science and Technology and its first responder resource group, uh, where we have represented fire and EMS, but uh, we are increasing that level of representation as we go forward. Some of the uh, research projects currently underway that are EMS-centric is we are revising the EMS Medical Director Handbook that has been around for a little over a decade, uh, almost a decade and a half. Um, an alternative funding for EMS and fire manual. This is a comprehensive document that um, lists out uh, funding sources far beyond federal grants uh, across uh, the country and business and industry. Uh, for us, it is the number one requested uh, document that we produce on Capitol Hill every year. Um, so it, it, it gets a lot of uh, weight and equity uh, put to that. Some, some new programs that we have, uh, research programs that we have invested in, is a Fire and EMS Civil Unrest Guide. Uh, that is ongoing right now in development. And we continue to update our emergency vehicle roadway safety operations and a number of uh, highway safety response documents that we have um, uh, promulgated over the uh, the years. Uh, they are currently under revision. We're also getting re ready to release the, the most recent edition of the Volunteer Recruitment and Retention uh, Manual, which is probably our second most requested document, uh, which is heavily represented to EMS and fire uh, as well. So those are just some highlights. There are a number of other, of other programs that are uh, that are underway, and I'd certainly uh, welcome uh, sidebar 
uh, discussions uh, if anybody is interested in that for further, more detailed information. But a couple other highlights, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just make note of that for the first responder community that is listening, um, Homeland Security has a information sharing network called HISN. It's the Homeland Security Information Sharing Network. And we have an EMS page that uh, is being built out on that site specifically for the emergency medical services uh, community. But what is of, of important, if not critical note, is, is that you must have an official email uh, in order to uh, join in. The information in this site is uh, for information, um, yeah, for official use only, and it's law enforcement sensitive. Thus, um, there is a, a clearance that has to occur. So. Uh, anybody that has a Gmail, AOL, MSN, Hotmail, et cetera, types of account, uh, you will not be eligible to do that. But state government, local government, uh, federal government uh, emails, you can. And I would encourage um, you know, people to check that out. And you can contact me or Mr. Greg Williams, who's also on the uh, call here, our lead EMS uh, contact, to, uh, to get more information on that. And then on the National Fire Academy side, I just wanted to point out and, and if there's new people on the line here that at the National Fire Academy, we have a comprehensive EMS program uh, on quite a few uh, topics. There's at least uh, six or eight uh, on site courses here in Emmitsburg, Maryland, as well as uh, distance learning uh, programs. But uh, the, the Fire Academy has worked diligently to incorporate EMS into all of their applicable programs from community risk reduction to executive fire officer. Uh, and the like. So just because it's called the National Fire Academy uh, should not discourage anybody with an EMS role from participating or attending in some of this uh, post-collegiate, in many ways, uh, academic uh, uh, education uh, information with that. Uh, as it relates to COVID, um, we did release, the USA, uh, USFA released its uh, official COVID response report earlier uh, this, or I guess it was late summer uh, of this year. Uh, it's a comprehensive uh, report uh, that talks about what the stakeholders uh, uh, informed us were the challenges and hurdles uh, during the past two and a half years. And I don't wanna say COVID's over because as you well know, it's not. Uh, so it's still ongoing, but the report provides uh, lists of recommendations uh, in order to um, facilitate improvements as we go forward, both dynamically and for future um, incidents. And then last but not least, I just wanted to highlight uh, the extensive work that um, our National Fire Data Center folks, uh, David Milstein is the branch chief, uh, working with Eric Cheney at NHTSA's office EVMS have been doing uh, literally just since our last meeting uh, on collaboration with the ENFERS, the National Fire Incident Reporting System, uh, and the NEMSIS data uh, to work on ways to better tell our story. Uh, as you may know, you know, in the fire service, uh, over 65% of all responses are to medical calls. Uh, and that's every fire department in, in the United States um, with that. So uh, we don't collect the detailed patient information that NEMSIS does but we obviously have the incident response information from a lot of other entities that may be there that were not included in some of the patient care reporting systems. So we're working to, uh, to collaborate and uh, our goal is to be able to produce some uh, combined reports as we go forward. So Mr. Chair, I'm gonna pause right there and uh, those are our updates for now, sir. Thank you, Rick, appreciate the update. Turning now for an update from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Yeah, good afternoon. This is Nanda Srinivasan again. Uh, our our uh, acting administrator elucidated some of the uh, some of the things we've been working on uh, when she, in her course of her talk, especially the mention about ambulance issues and and what we've been doing about about those issues uh, about uh, the issues that the EMS community faces, especially after COVID nineteen. Uh, Chair Green, thanks for all your work again. Uh, post crash care is a big part, as she mentioned, as part of our national roadway safety strategy. Uh, we received a lot of suggestions from uh, from NEMSAC. But I also want to hark back to the 40 years of work that NHTSA has put on emergency medical services. Uh, we, 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 we support emergency medical services because we simply think that that's, that's a fastest and best way to save lives post crash. 
Uh, we strengthen America's medi Ameri emergency medical ser service systems in order that we reap the benefits of uh, reduced fatalities uh, due, to, due to traffic crashes. And we do this in several ways, and I mentioned this before at these meetings, but in terms of our EMS uh, role, uh, it, many of the facets are highlighted at ems.gov. Um, I can mention a couple, but I really want to focus on one thing that Richard Patrick pointed out, the value of collaboration. Uh, we've all gone through COVID-19. We've all gone through many of the exercises that, uh, that uh, have cost us staff, that have cost us uh, you know, lives, uh, and, and we've emerged from it hopefully stronger and wiser for it. Uh, but Richard pointed out the value of collaboration in many ways. NEMSIS is one of them. Uh, we've strived hard uh, to get NEMSIS to go green across the whole map, 50 states. We worked on education issues. We worked on this uh, on the on the on the triage guidelines uh, last year. Um, and so, if you go to the EMS.gov webpage now, it's refurbished. It's new. We talk about each of these with with resources, including the EMS agenda that you all worked on uh, going forward. So, uh, Chair Green, thanks for that opportunity to provide us uh, the 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 ability to provide an update. Uh, Tons of things to talk about in terms of workforce, in terms of NEMSIS, in terms of our involvement with 911 issues, research of which we form a core part here, uh, advancing uh, uh, EMS systems, uh, all, all parts of them uh, of for which we have many projects underway. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be part of this group and we're glad, glad to continue the, the collaboration we've engendered over the decades uh, and I look forward to more work with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Nanda. Appreciate the update. Turning now to the Federal Communications Commission. Good afternoon, everybody. This is David Firth again. Glad to be here. And um, I'm going to update a couple of things that the commission is doing. As, as I think this audience is aware, our primary mission in the EMS space is to improve the communication systems that support emergency medical response. And in particular, we focus quite closely on the 911 system. And uh, in that context, I updated, I believe, at the last e FICOMS meeting in June on some developments in 911, and I've got a further update to provide today. Um, this uh, is an initiative that the Commission's been engaged in for some time to improve wireless call routing for 911 calls. And by way of background, uh, this is an issue that is important to the EMS community because the more quickly 911 calls can be routed to the correct public safety answering point or 911 call center, uh, what we sometimes call PSAPs, the more quickly emergency response can be dispatched and uh, obviously in a medical emergency, seconds count. So the, the less time spent in getting the call to the correct call center, the better. And historically with wireless 911 calls, since the inception of wireless 911 over 30 years ago, uh, those calls have historically been routed based on the location of the cell tower that receives the initial call from the caller. So if I'm making a 911 call here in the national capital region, and uh, let's say that I am in Maryland, which is where I live, um, the cell tower that uh, takes my call will determine which PSAP that call will go to. And it's possible that if I'm close to a jurisdictional border, I'm close to the District of Columbia, or I'm close to Virginia, that call might go to the DC PSAP or the Virginia PSAP, even though I'm in Maryland. And that uh, then necessitates a call transfer, which takes time uh, and uh, the expenditure of resources. It's something that PSAPs are very used to doing, but uh, obviously the fewer reroutes that are necessary, the better. And the thing that has changed in this uh, environment is the technology that is now available to route wireless 911 calls that was not available when wireless 911 started. So in that scenario, in that same scenario where let's say I make a 911 call in, in Maryland and it is received by a cell tower in Virginia, there's now technology that would tell the network provider, the carrier, that I'm in Maryland. And so even though the cell tower that received the call is in Virginia, if the carrier has network information that knows that I'm in Maryland, they can route that call to the correct PSAP in Maryland. So that technology has been in development and it's now starting to be deployed. And as I indicated in the update in June, 
the commission at that point had been looking at the issue for a number of years. Uh, and the commission in June issued a public notice in which we sought additional comment to update the record to find out what the current state of technology is and to figure out what next steps to take. And we're now taking uh, a critical next step. And this will happen at the commission's upcoming agenda meeting uh, on December 21st. And at that meeting, the commission will be considering a notice of proposed rulemaking. This is a specific regulatory proposal that if adopted would put out for public comment proposed rules that would require wireless carriers and text providers to use what we call location-based routing, which is routing based on location of the caller uh, to route 911 calls. And we think that this has the potential to ultimately result in millions fewer calls needing to be transferred. Uh, and those calls would go to the correct PSAP in the first instance. So where we are procedurally right now is this is still a proposal. The commission has not yet adopted it. They will consider it at the uh, December meeting and barring the unexpected, we, we expect that the proposal will be adopted. You can actually see the public draft of what the commission will be considering on our website because the commission for each agenda meeting publishes all items that the commission will consider in draft form three weeks ahead of the meeting. So if you go to FCC.gov and look at the information on December meeting, you can see this draft proposal. Once the commission consider it, considers it at its December meeting and assuming that the NPRM is adopted, there would then be a public comment period, which would go into 2023 for interested parties to comment on the proposal. And then again, assuming that the record is supportive of moving forward with the proposal, there's the potential for the commission to adopt rules later in 2023. So it's an important development for 911. It tracks existing technology that's already being deployed and some carriers have already started to use it for uh, at least some calls uh, that go to 911 call centers. So we see it as a, a major potential uh, advance and uh, we'll obviously be happy to provide further updates on this as the, the this rulemaking proceeds. Thank you. Thank you, David. And now rounding out our uh, FICOMS representative update, I turn to state EMS directors. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in October, our NZIMZO president-elect Joe House from Kansas uh, moderated a, a well-attended joint national EMS leadership forum meeting. Uh, topics uh, that were discussed in detail uh, we're uh, distinguishing EMS as its own emergency support function and EMS specific content in the national response framework and lifelines. Uh, Ebola uh, virus disease reemergence was discussed, uh, ambulance chassis shortages, expense and production delays, drug shortages, PPE availability and cost. And on, on a more positive note, uh, Congress uh, House Bill 8994 that creates grants for local EMS agencies. Uh, another topic of significance is that the White House Office of National Drug uh, Control Policy has taken actions moving forward related to the use of state EMS office patient care report data uh, to create the first ever national dashboard on non-fatal overdoses utilizing them as data uploaded by the states. Uh, there are several projects that uh, uh, our national office of state EMS officials currently have underway. Uh, public health, uh, one of those is uh, the public health emergency guidelines for collaboration between EMS, public health, emergency management, and 911. Uh, our airway evidence-based guidelines, strategic planning, and uh, workforce measurement project. Uh, the, this project will serve to standardize methods for states to consider to uh, that uh, enables apples-to-apples -apples comparisons and uh, aggregation of information. Uh, workforce uh, not only affects uh, agencies, but it also affects state EMS offices. State EMS offices uh, continue uh, to, to implement projects that support state and federal activities like NIMS's when uh, states cannot compete for technical staff with the private sector. So that's that's starting to become a, a problem as well. Uh, projects like NIMS's and the development of data quality metrics are imperative uh, to our ongoing system of our state EMS systems. Uh, we've worked for years to standardize data collection uh, but it, it's time to start thinking about uh, standardizing uh, data dissemination through quality metrics and, and so forth. 
Uh, state directors continue to increase the focus on uh, EMS provider health and wellness while we watch suicide rates of emergency responders increase. So do what we can to uh, increase our activities in that area. Uh, and then also to end on a more positive note or in personal note is uh, have personally had the opportunity to activate the national medical transport and support contract probably about three or four times now. And uh, th that response continues to just improve year after year. So that concludes my report chair. Thank you, Steve. That completes the updates from the FICOMS representatives. It's now time for project updates from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration Office of EMS. And we'll start with National 911 program. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Brian Tegmar. I'm the coordinator for the National 911 program, uh, which operates under the NHTSA's Office of EMS. At the National 911 program, we're working to advance 911 across the nation. To do this, we collaborate with our stakeholders to address the issues, we create and share resources to help 911 systems. We're working to support the transition to next generation 911 and monitor the progress via the next generation 911 roadmap and identify the, the 911 system's ability to impact post crash care and improve traffic safety overall. What I'd like to do this afternoon, just very briefly, is give you an update on some of the projects we've been working on. And those projects include. Um, our stakeholder engagement over the last uh, year. Next slide, uh, where we've worked with our uh, stakeholders on our uh, NASNA, the National Association of State 911 Administrators Regional Interoperability Workshops. Those five workshops brought together 911 professionals from the state with their uh, SWICs and alerts and warnings and uh, in regional meetings that provided them with. Um, Challenges and updates and how to improve interoperability and work together. We presented at SafeCom Next Wix conference. Uh, we worked on the Next Generation 911 Interoperability Summit, which is going to evolve into an interoperability task force talking about conformance and standards for next generation 911 solutions. We're heavily engaged in GIS activities, including attending the Tribal GIS Conference, attending the National States. Uh, GIS uh, conference at NISJIC and collaborating with our national, state, and local partners on 911 988 issues throughout the year. We've continued to uh, work and establish our industry relationships on the important issues of 911. We also work to close out the 911 grant that was uh, created in 2012 and closed out on September 30th, 2022. 33 states, the District of Columbia, and two tribal nations were awarded 109 million. And we completed the grant and all unspent grant, any unspent grant funds were deobligated. We continue to work on the National Profile Database, which results in the collection and survey of states on 911 data that's published in an annual report. Um, the collection uh, this year is expected to be out in February of 2023, and that will have 2021 data. Uh, a lot of work has gone into the next generation 911 roadmap. We engaged over the last year with our stakeholders to try to create an outreach report, which will hopefully be published before the end of the year or shortly thereafter. And that uh, roadmap is updated on the website 911.gov to provide uh, a new way to look at the status and the work that's going on. Uh, additionally, next slide, we have been working on data in 911. Our data path project, which launched a couple of years ago, is still in progress with one of its pilot programs now. And it is a nationally uniformed uh, 911 data set that will provide our community leaders with essential information to assist with strategic planning, governance decisions, operational improvements at all levels. Um, and we're looking to find ways to collect this data um, and potentially move it into a complete national data set of operational 911 information, as well as collecting administrative information about the 911 centers themselves. As mentioned earlier, we are working with our GIS assessment, trying to provide GIS guidelines and documents and resources for our state and local tribal territorial partners so that they understand what is needed to get GIS in a state needed to advance for uh, the next generation 911. Our next project is our CAD assessment. Um, as many of you know, 911 centers work in an interoperable environment and oftentimes are dispatching mutual aid resources and the ability for CAD systems to communicate with each other is extremely important. So we're working to make sure that um, we can identify the issues 
best practices and potentially even some governance agreement models that can be used for 911 kit data sharing uh, nationwide. Next slide. Uh, our final thing we're working on is um, our State of 911 webinar. Our last webinar was on November 8th. It focused on our cybersecurity gaps and improving resiliency and combating staffing and retention challenges. That will be available to rewatch online probably in the next two weeks. Our next State of 911 webinar is January 10th, and we're expecting some great topics for uh, everyone to engage on 911 issues. With that, my contact information is on the screen, and that is the end of my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate the update. Let's move on to uh, electric vehicles, Dave Bryson. Very good. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Dave Bryson of the NHTSA Office of EMS, and I also serve as a subject matter expert for NHTSA's high-voltage battery team. Next slide, please. Because of the limited time, I'll focus on high-voltage battery incidents for passenger cars, SUVs, and light trucks, but won't discuss other lithium-ion battery-powered devices or larger vehicles, though NHTSA does recognize these two are challenges for our first responder community. Next slide. I got involved when NHTSA stood up its high-voltage battery team in 2011 after a crash-tested Chevy Volt ignited days after crash testing. Next slide, please. In 2012, NHTSA partnered with the Department of Energy, the U.S. Fire Administration, the National Fire Protection Association, and others to create interim guidance for high-voltage battery events. Three one-page guidance documents were also created from this document that targeted vehicle owners, first responders, and the towing and storage community. Next slide. I'm quickly providing an FPA's EV crash and fire training site at this top QR code, as well as their site, which features the emergency response guides or ERGs that are produced by hybrid electric vehicle and electric vehicle manufacturers, as these are critical tools for any first responder responding to high voltage battery events, particularly in vehicles. Next slide. When Hurricane Sandy struck the East Coast in October of 2012, more than 20,000 vehicles in Port Newark, New Jersey, were destroyed by the storm surge. 338 of those vehicles were fiscal karmas. Within one day of being submerged, 16 of those 338 karmas burned after one of the vehicles experienced what we call thermal runaway, which was due to saltwater crystals forming a bridge to cause a shirt short circuit in its high voltage battery. Next slide, please. After extensive research and investigation of the Fisker fire, NHTSA and our partners updated the interim guidance in 2014 to now include the hazards of submersion, particularly salt water, to high voltage batteries. Next slide. In January of 2021, our partners at NTSB released a safety report which included recommendations to EV manufacturers, NHTSA, and the U.S. Fire Service. Next slide. As a result of the NTSB report, NHTSA and USFA have partnered to create working best practices for mitigating hybrid electric vehicle and electric vehicle crashes and fires. This is due in late 2023. Next slide, please. Oh, actually stay at this slide. Thank you. Fast forward to October of this year when Hurricane Ian struck Florida. Florida was able to map the Gulf Coast region to estimate that approximately 1,500 electric vehicles may have been submerged in three counties. Of these 1,500 vehicles, we have confirmed there are 17 EV fire events that involve 15 Teslas, one Porsche, and one Lucid. It is too early to know whether the number of Tesla events is due to the high proportion of Teslas that are in that region, which is true, or if there's a more specific issue attributed to the Teslas involved. A federal partner team is going to Florida next week to meet with local fire departments who mitigated those 17 EV-related fire events, and that team is also going to visit a storage area where soon-to-be federally procured damaged electric vehicles 
will be inspected in preparation for a much more extensive federal research effort planned for early 2023. Next slide, please. Now, USDOT and NHTSA need your help. We're asking all partners who provide the public and first responders with guidance for storm and flood preparedness, response, mitigation, and recovery to please update your guidance to include information about the hazard of high voltage batteries. Next slide. In the pre-event phase, we encourage HEV and EV owners to evacuate early due to limited charging infrastructure, at least today, and extra time needed to charge batteries along evacuation routes. If not evacuating your HEVs or EVs, please move these vehicles to higher ground and away from storm surge or flooding areas. Please power down residential HEV and EV charging stations and also disconnect the vehicles from those charging stations. Next slide, please. In the event phase, as the storm is striking or there is active surge or flooding, do not start or operate any vehicles in high water and do not charge or operate it. Suspected flooded or submerged EVs as they may be a shock hazard or fire hazard. And of course, if you're driving and approach a flooded roadway or low water crossing, turn around, don't drown. Next slide, please. In the post event phase, we reiterate the two critical points from the previous slide and then add how important it is for the removal of suspected flooded or submerged HEVs or EVs outside and away from structures. You need to be, you need to use caution when doing so as turning the drive axle on the vehicle could inadvertently charge the vehicle and lead to a fire event. And finally, store damaged HEVs and EVs at least 50 feet from structures and other vehicles. We know that the DMIM batteries have ignited up to several weeks post damage. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thanks, Dave. Um, we'll turn to Eric Cheney for a NEMSIS update. And Eric, uh, it has a time here of 10 minutes, and I urge you to use as much of that as you need because I need to step away from the screen for just a moment. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Chairman Green. Normally, I would I was going to say I'll be brief, but maybe I can stretch it out a little bit longer for you this morning. Um, welcome all. Um, I want to give you just a, a very brief overview of some of the federal projects, and I say federal projects underway, um, given the focus of this committee. Next slide, please. Um, basically, the the list that you see before you is just a partial list impacting the members of this committee. Uh, the CDC data hub, the work we're doing with stroke crash harmonization um, with MUC FARS, which also impacts uh, obviously DOT as well. Um, these are just some of the examples of the projects we have underway with CDC. I've included a list from the Department of Transportation, Health and Human Services, DHS, NIH, and the White House as well. There is a list three times this long for the states. Uh, right now underway. I'm currently out at the University of Utah this week working with the Technical Assistance Center, and we are planning out 2023. The whiteboard that you can't see that's in front of me has a project list on it that's just enormous and growing. The use of NEMSIS data at the local, state, and federal level has just ballooned since COVID. It's an outstanding uh, representation of just how well this data and how powerful, how well this data can be used and how powerful it is when it's used. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the importance of the agencies, the EMS agencies, whether that's the local volunteer ambulance service with one or two ambulances, or whether that's the large for-profit ambulance service in, in the urban area, is collecting the same data. They're also um, funding the collection of that data and sending that data to the state in some cases in the states under requirement, in some cases under a voluntary process. But then that state piece is the very important piece, working with the National Association of State EMS officials. The states are voluntarily sending that data to the National EMS Information System, um, 
where we use it for these federal projects. And this afternoon, there will be a project released uh, from the White House. I was hoping I was going to be able to show it with you, show it to you today. However, it is embargoed. As soon as the information is available, we will make that available to all the members of the FICOMS uh, work group, basically uh, relating to um, opioid, non fatal opioid overdose. Once you see that, I think you will really start to think about how this could be used in your organization, how NEMSIS data could be used in your organization in a similar way uh, to show national trends. The data that you'll see this afternoon is very timely, and uh, I think it'll, uh, you'll really paint a picture for just what the possibilities are. I want to emphasize what Steve said uh, in his presentation. It is getting, um, you know, everything that we're doing is more costly getting the resources, not only the, the finances, but the people, um, whether we're hiring at the NEMSIS Technical Assistance Center, whether states are hiring at the state data manager level, or the local EMS agency is trying to hire someone who can help them uh, develop the reports that they use on a daily basis out of NEMSIS data. The individual that we're looking for there is costing more money, the resources to store the data, um, the resources to make the data safe, and then the actual collection process, whether that's the hardware or whether that's the software used on the hardware, is all costing more money. I bring that up to uh, go to the next slide, please. We have worked through the data uh, integration subcommittee to, um, you, you can go to the next slide, please. We have worked through the data integration subcommittee to basically address something that uh, Chairman Green said to me about two meetings ago. I talked about uh, a steady funding stream to support data collection at the local and state agency level. And uh, Mr. Chairman, your comment back to me was, well, Eric, you haven't asked us for anything. So uh, I think my ask today is that uh, FICOMS establish a, a subgroup, whether that's a part of the, the data integration group or a separate group, to look at how the federal agencies and federal partners that are using this data now, and th those were listed were just a partial list, but on a daily basis, how they can work to, to provide a steady funding stream to the state and local EMS agencies that are collectively um, putting this together. Um, the slide that we skipped over basically says what that group looks like. Essentially, we have approximately 14,000 EMS agencies through the United States. And some of those, as Rick pointed out, um, are fire-based EMS services. A lot of them are fire-based EMS services, are providing data voluntarily to this process and there is a cost to their operations to make this data available so the third bullet there is, is obviously the the key uh, to my presentation today but i'll go back and hit the first two we have made some progress on building an inventory of emergency response data collection systems um, as rick said i have met with uh, david milstein at the u.s fire administration to talk not only about the harmonization of NEMSIS and NFERS, but what other data sets that are out there on the emergency management side of the house and other emergency response organizations that we should be harmonizing with. COVID taught us um, a lesson in resource management. Our response was um, in need of resources. Those resources come through emergency management and there wasn't a real good technology connection between the emergency management side of the house and the NEMSIS and NFERS side of the house. So that's one area that we've already identified. The second bullet established a process for coordinating data projects, grants, and development of metrics, performance measures, and reporting efforts. Again, um, Steve has mentioned that in Florida, they have had uh, a very good, uh, they were in a good position leading some of the metrics developments, supporting the National EMS Quality Alliance in developing those. By doing this, it allows the states to report out on a national level consistent uh, metrics and uh, preventing individual states and individual agencies from developing metrics that aren't consistent with national standards and national guidelines. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll stop there and happy to entertain any questions. All right, thank you, Eric. I appreciate the update. Turning now to Healthcare Resilience Working Group and the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention for EMS. My name is Kate Elkins and I am an EMS and 911 specialist in the Office of EMS and with the National 911 Program. 
Thank you for this opportunity to pre-record and present my update for the FICOMS meeting. The Healthcare Resilience Working Group continues to function in a warm state with meetings of the leadership and uh, active engagement still with the EMS and pre-hospital team. We continue to meet with stakeholders to really understand what they're going through as we evolve in the response to COVID-19 and adding in the responses to Ebola and MPOX with the lessons that we've learned from the COVID-19 response. We continue to track supply shortages and report them out to the supply tower and others. We have many federal partners that are working on everything from the chip shortages to the ambulance shortages to supply chain for meds. Um, we understand that there continue to be funding challenges and we really appreciate all of our federal partners that have had funding opportunities available to EMS and 911 communities. The workforce continues to be a challenge. We are losing members to other jobs, to working in hospitals as they're short staffed, as well as the challenges of recruiting people into the educational pipeline. We continue to be engaged with the educational pipeline to really work on what can be done to improve pulling people into this field, getting them through the pipeline, and then retaining them and taking care of them as they work in EMS and 911 settings. Mental health of the EMS and 911 workforce continues to be an important issue. We are the safety net oftentimes for people in crisis, and it is important for us to be prepared, educated, and equipped to respond to those patients. But we can't neglect the fact that our workforce oftentimes also needs resources. I am happy to be able to represent the interests of the EMS and 911 communities on the White House IPC and several sub IPCs. We've been able to present about EMS and 911 to federal partners, as well as bringing them into 911 centers and potentially in the near future, getting them out on EMS units to do ride alongs. 988 was implemented in July. It has been a lot of work, a lot of collaboration between multiple federal agencies and the communities. There's still a lot of work to be done. We still need to improve how 988 and 911 interact. And now as we move into the phase where they're building out mobile crisis and crisis stabilization centers, we wanna make sure that the existing EMS and 911 systems are interoperable with the systems that are being developed. We know that our communities need improved crisis resources. It is incredibly important that our systems and those systems are able to collaborate and interoperate effectively. We continue to collaborate with CDC and NIOSH to improve research, not only for the mental health of our workforce and suicide prevention of our workforce, but also related to violence against our workforce and injuries. We hope with the first year of data from the public safety module of the NVDRS system to see some innovative uh, research into the suicide issue we have among first responders. We continue to collaborate with the SAMHSA Office of Suicide Prevention, encouraging more collaboration with EMS and 911 communities, and really trying to get improved representation from the EMS and the 911 communities on the Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention Public Safety Working Group. It is important to have evidence-based interventions and good resources, so we are trying to build out the resources that we have on EMS.gov and 911.gov, and we continue to pull together all of these people from researchers to clinicians to people with innovative evidence-based interventions um, to really cross-pollinate and understand all the people who are working in this space. In January of 2023, we will restart the mental health listening sessions to really try to gather in one place a lot of different people in a lot of different parts of the federal government, state government, local government, and the community to really cross-pollinate and understand who's doing what to address these challenges. Tribal and rural EMS and 911 face significant challenges that some of their other counterparts don't face. There are places that don't have established systems. There are places that have very limited cell signal and broadband. There are a lot of things that really challenge. If you're covering a large area with large patches where you don't have cell signal, there's a lot that you have to overcome in these rural and tribal communities. In order to really connect and, and identify the resources that are available, we have started having monthly meetings with the Indian Health Service, the University of New Mexico Center for Tribal and Rural EMS, the NEMSAC Tribal Representative and OEMS staff. The goal is to collaborate so that we can identify who's doing what in this space 
And how do we identify tribal EMS and 911 agencies to really provide technical assistance and resources to improve conditions in their communities? We've been collaborating with its regional grant programs and have already had some benefits to some tribal EMS agencies. We continue to collaborate in addressing GIS, especially next generation 911 compliant GIS mapping layers for these remote, rural, and tribal communities. You have to have an interoperable or an interconnected complete GIS layer in order to use next generation 911 routing or geolocation for the call. As we build out improved GIS systems in these communities, it benefits the EMS agencies in terms of response. It benefits the communities in terms of their um, Department of Transportation, maybe deliveries and addressing. And so this is an area where we continue to collaborate with tribal GIS organizations, 911 organizations, and EMS organizations. As we improve tribal and rural resources, it's going to take the work of multiple federal agencies to make sure we're all understanding all the good work that's happening in this space. There's so many opportunities to collaborate, to share the information that we're doing, to share the financial resources we're providing to these communities. So this interoperability can actually be achieved in some of the most remote rural and tribal areas. If you have not been on 911.gov recently, please check it out. It had a little bit of a refresh this summer and we're really excited about the new look of the page and it being more accessible, having a great search function and docs and tools and some additional resources. We are just getting ready to launch the new version of EMS.gov. So coming soon to a website near you, it'll be more accessible. There'll be some additional resources. It'll have a slightly different organization. If you have any questions or concerns or you're doing exciting work in this space that you'd like to share, please reach out and let me know. Great. Thanks. I'm glad we were able to get that brief. It was an excellent brief. Thanks to Kate. And thanks to all of those updates from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration Office of EMS. And now we'll move on to updates from the technical working group. The FICOMS technical working group is subdivided into five subgroups with a set of co-chairs leading each subgroup. The subgroups are the working components of the technical working group. To keep things running smoothly, I'll call out the name of the technical working group subgroup and one of the co-chairs each will introduce him or herself, their co-chair, and provide the subgroup's update. And we'll start with EMS systems integration and preparedness. Thank you, uh, Chairman Green. Uh, this is Gam Wijaitunga. I co-chair the EMS systems integration and preparedness committee with T. Morsing Kinata, and I'll be providing the uh, committee's update today. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the members of the committee include Chris Hanley from the Navy, Mark Gentleman from DOD, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, Andrew Hauer from the Department of the Interior, National Park Service, John Brasco from USFA, Mike Stern from USFA, Drew Nauman from the DOD's National Center for Disaster Medicine and Public Health, Sophia Arias from HRSA EMS for Children, Cinnamon Dixon from the NIH, Andre Pennart, the Chief Medical Officer for FEMA, Greg Williams from USFA, Lewis Moore from the Navy, and Clary Mole from the NHTSA Office of EMS. Next slide, please. The goal uh, that the committee focuses on within the FICOM's uh, strategic plan is EMS systems fully integrated into state, territorial, local, tribal, regional, and federal preparedness, planning, response, and recovery. Within that goal, we focus on objective 3.3, improve EMS system preparedness for all hazards, including pandemic influenza, through support of coordinated multidisciplinary planning for all disasters. Next slide, please. Over the uh, past uh, several months, as the committee has met, we've explored opportunities for collaboration uh, between the committee members and across the uh, TWG and FICOMS for uh, improving EMS system integration and preparedness initiatives. We've received briefings from HRSA's Maternal and Child Health Bureau programs, specifically from the Pediatric Pandemic Network. And we've also received briefings 
from EMSC's EMS Emerging Issues Grant Program focused on children and youth with special health care needs, specifically the Oregon Hero Kids Registry and building capacity in emergency preparedness and response with family partners of children with complex needs in Pennsylvania. The group uh, continues to explore opportunities to improve disaster preparedness for children and youth with special health care needs. And I'd also add that uh, the committee is also taking a look at the National EMS Advisory Council's recent recommendations issued to FICOMS on improving post-crash care. And we anticipate some follow-up on this at the next FICOMS meeting. Next slide, please. And Chair Green, we have no specific requests for actions from FICOMS at this time. That concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Gam. Moving now to evidence-based practice and quality. Hello everyone, my name is Diane Pilkey and I'm a senior nurse consultant um, in the Maternal Child Health Bureau um, at HRSA and I co-chair this uh, group with Max Severoid from NHTSA Office of EMS. Um, these are, uh, this slide shows representations from federal agencies um, onto this um, subcommittee and our group focuses on the promotion of pre-hospital evidence-based treatment including the development and propagation of evidence-based guidelines and measurements of performance and outcomes. Next slide. There, there are several goals and objectives from the FICOM strategic plan that are relevant to our work group. One of the primary ones is to support the development, implementation, and evaluation of evidence-based guidelines. Um, and just to provide a few updates from the work agencies are doing in this arena, um, the SEMSO is currently leading the development of a pre-hospital airway evidence-based guideline, uh, a process that will likely take a couple of years, um, but products will include an evidence-based guideline training materials and performance measure development. In addition, 2022 saw the completion of an evidence-based guideline on pre-hospital pain management and revisions of the national model EMS guidelines and the field trauma triage evidence-based guideline. Next slide. The working group um, also addresses goal one objectives that are listed on this slide. Um, and a few highlights from that, um, the Evidence-Based Practice Center at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality recently published an evidence review on infection prevention and control for the EMS and 911 workforce. The National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is providing ongoing updates about the recent Ebola virus disease outbreak in Uganda. And the CDC has updated this to the guidance for EMS and 911 systems, um, providing answering talking points to help manage patients under investigation in the United States. Um, and HRSA's um, EMS for Children Innovation and Improvement Resource Center has created um, several pediatric education and advocacy kits to, which house best practices and resources to maximize the application of current pediatric evidence into clinical practice by frontline healthcare providers. The current kits include ones on status epileptica, suicide, pain, and agitation. Next slide. Um, and in terms of addressing areas where uh, special concerns posed by geography or in which access may be limited, the HRSA Federal Office of Rural Health Policy which focuses on building capacity for rural health care, uh, recently awarded supplemental flex grant funds to six states to increase accurate EMS reporting and to educate EMS staff and leadership on using data to drive quality improvement at the agency level. Those states were Alabama, Michigan, North Dakota, New Mexico, Utah, and Washington. Uh, next slide. And finally, we have no action items from this group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane. Moving to EMS data standards and exchange. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my name is Rachel Abbey. I'm with the, uh, HHS's Office of the National Coordinator for uh, Health Information Technology. I'm in the Office of Policy there. And my co-chair is uh, David Milston from the USFA. Um, these are our members of our uh, data standards and exchange uh, committee, 
And um, our charge is basically to um, ensure better coordination um, within the agencies around EMS data exchange and um, data standards. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Uh, so we'll have, we have three goals that we focus on. The first goal is here around coordinated, integrated federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial EMS and 911 systems that provide safe and efficient, high quality uh, patient care. This is our uh, objective that we focus on here under this goal. Um, we have been active in regards to updating linkages with other data systems, and we share those on a regular basis on our monthly calls. Um, USFA, you know, continues investigation to the future linkage with numerous data sets aligning with the goal of enhancing the use and usability of MFERS data. And um, you heard about the linkages around with NEMSIS data that Richard Patrick uh, mentioned earlier. Um, they are also currently under invest, uh, working on investigation into the social economic relationships to fire and loss. Okay, next slide, please. This is our second goal, which is around data-driven, evidence-based, and standardized EMS and 911 systems that help to improve the quality of out-of-hospital patient care. Um, these are our three objectives. And um, as you heard through Eric Cheney's presentation specifically around NEMSIS updates, um, I think that that kind of speaks to itself as it relates to this, object, uh, this goal and these objectives. Uh, next slide, please. Lastly, this is um, our third goal that we focus on is goal number four, which is EMS and 911 systems that are uh, people-centered, uh, sustainable, forward-looking, and integrated with the overall healthcare system. Um, we are working on several projects here. Um, uh, both ONC and uh, NHTSA are going to hopefully um, have a follow-up summit to our 2020 uh, January EMS and HIE Summit, um, hopefully in the spring of 2023. So we are in process and working on that. Um, the second is that is more focused around standards development um, affecting EMS and promoting um, uh, exchange. Um, specifically, I wanna highlight um, an HL7 CDA um, R2 implementation guide that was just recently developed for ePulsed, which is the portable medical uh, orders uh, and uh, treatment. And so that is in release one that has been approved by HL7, which is a standards-based um, organization and is being piloted in several states as we speak. Um, okay, and um, I believe that is it. Next slide, yes, uh, we have no, um, action items recommended uh, to FICOMS at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And thank you for that update. Turning now to workforce and safety. Good afternoon, this is David Bryson. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of the workforce and safety subgroup uh, joined by Greg Williams out of the US Fire Administration. Next slide, please. Uh, there you see the co-chairs. Uh, and we have a lot of good represent representation of federal partners. Uh, one correction to this slide and worth noting, uh, congratulations to Jim Green of NIOSH, uh, who was able to retire from federal service at the end of October, but Audrey Reichard and uh, Suzanne Marsh uh, have always been doing wonderful work for NIOSH and representing uh, the team. So uh, we will miss Jim. Congratulations to Jim, uh, but the committee is continuing on. Next slide, please. Uh, we have two goals, goal five in the MS 911 culture, which safety considerations for patients, practitioners, and the community permeate the full spectrum of activities. And of course, goal six, a uniform credential to EMS and 911 workforce uh, with the education skills and competency uh, to keep pace with evolving healthcare needs. Next slide, please. 
uh, some of the objectives. Objective 5.1, promote the reporting, measurement, prevention, and mitigation of occupational injuries, deaths, and exposures to serious infectious illnesses in the U.S. workforce. Uh, we know the U.S. Fire Administration, the Federal Highway Administration, and others uh, when it comes to some of the um, uh, injuries and deaths have been working on the transportation related and uh, have spun up uh, over the past year a uh, reporting system to that goes through um, uh, the respondersafety.com uh, uh, organization. So there's a self-reporting there of any uh, struck by or transportation related incidents. So we're collecting uh, more data there. Objective 5.2 evaluate factors within EMS practices that contribute to medical errors or threat patient safety. Uh, we'll continue to have guest speakers and uh, follow a lot of activities going on with that objective. Next slide, please. Objective 5.3, an anonymous reporting system to record and evaluate medical errors, adverse events, and near misses. Uh, we continue to have uh, speakers come in and look for projects and get updates about those activities. Uh, we know there have been some changes to a number of the uh, reporting systems, and we need to report that back uh, as soon as we get a handle on that to uh, the other TWG committees and the FICOMs. Uh, objective 5-4. Uh, oops, go back one. So there you go. FICOMs are on supporting implementation of the National EMS Culture of Safety Strategy Kudos uh, from our committee to American College of Emergency Physicians and the National Association of EMTs uh, who co-host and chair uh, the National EMS Safety Council phone calls. Uh, those are done monthly. I believe that group might be 40 plus individuals with a lot of federal partners on there. Uh, and that group is tasked with continuing to push and promote uh, the EMS culture safety strategy. Next slide, please. Promote the use of technology, training, and equipment now to enhance the safety of EMS practitioners. Jen Marshall of NIST continues to bring in uh, drones and other uh, wonderful uh, equipment and devices uh, that can help with safety. And it's pretty exciting to have her present uh, when she gets a chance to join us. Next slide, please. Should be goal six. Great. Continue to implement the uh, EMS education agenda for the future and encourage more uniform EMS education, uh, national certification, and licensing, uh, and support efforts to enhance the interstate legal recognition and reciprocity of EMS practitioners across uh, jurisdictions and continue to do that through the uh, EMS Compact. Next slide, please. Uh, continue to work with state EMS office, offices to support transition of military EMS providers uh, to civilian practice. Excellent resources up on the National Association of State EMS Officials website uh, for folks to go and see that. And uh, many feds that worked on that, uh, particularly DOD with the SEMSO. Objective 6.4, promote the implementation of the EMS workforce agenda for the future. Uh, to encourage data-driven EMS workforce planning. Uh, that continues through a number of efforts that I think you've already heard reports about today. Next slide, please. And we continue to coordinate uh, with a number of committees, as you saw. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are so many individual reports done by uh, other federal partners and NHTSA uh, that relate to a lot of what we do. I don't think we have another slide on this, but there are no asks of the FICOMs at this time. Thank you. Thank you. And now rounding out the subgroup updates, a turn to education and training. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Clary Mole. I'm an EMS specialist in the Office of EMS at NHTSA. I'm one of the co-chairs for the education and training subgroup of the technical working group. I co-chair this uh, group, or subgroup rather, with Michael Stern from the United States Fire Administration. Our members are Lewis Moore from the Navy, uh, Dion Reed from Indian Health Service, Greg Williams from USFA, and Dave Bryson, uh, my colleague in the Office of EMS at NHTSA. Next slide. 
I'm going to share some information with you guys today rather than reading through the objectives and the goals. Um, thank you all the other sub subgroups of the technical working group because you guys already read my goals and uh, objectives for me. But the information that I'm going to present today is being used to apprise FICOMS members or representatives of the national EMS education and training activities. The information was provided by national EMS education stakeholders and provides relevance to which provides relevance to FICOM statutory purposes and the statute, excuse me, the strategic plan. It's no way meant to endorse these organi organizations or their activities. Next slide. So I'm gonna start off with how things start with EM education, EMS education. Uh, you'll start with an EMT program and then you go to an advanced EMT program and finally you make it to a paramedic program in many cases. Paramedic programs are accredited the accreditation body for paramedic programs is KHEP. KHEP is the Commission on Accreditation for Allied Health Education Programs. KHEP gets its authority from TIA, the Council on Higher Education Accreditation. And once KHEP is divided into several committees because it is Allied Health, um, 32, I believe, uh, is how many committees they have. And one of the committees is specifically for EMS education. And that committee is the Committee on the Accreditation for EMS Professions, often called COAMPS. Next slide. COAMPS has had activity all around the world, as far as Saudi Arabia to Alaska and all over the United States in Hawaii. Next slide. Again, these are all paramedic programs that are accredited. At this point, COAMPS is reporting that they have 742 programs that are paramedic programs that are accredited or on the way to accreditation. Of those 742, 629 of them are, are fully accredited, whereas 114 of them are seeking accreditation. COAMPS provides uh, programs seeking accreditation with a letter of review, which allows them to have students enrolled and uh, had them matriculate through the programs um, until COAMPS can make their recommendation for uh, accreditation to KHEP. Next slide. Paramedic programs are sponsored um, by several uh, entities, uh, post-secondary and government predominantly, but they can be also hospital or consortium based, military based. Um, consortium, just to kind of let you know what that means, is um, whenever you have a group of individuals that come together and represent other groups within um, these sponsor types and they support uh, a, a program. Um, that's a rough definition of what a consortium is. Next slide. So looking at EMS education programs, the technical working group subgroup of education and training kind of don't have any uh, actions uh, planned at this point, but we were thinking about things that we could potentially do or FICOMS could, we could work with um, our, our stakeholders, organizational stakeholders uh, to improve education nationwide. So just to kind of point some things out, EMT and advanced EMT education programs are authorized by states and territories. We know that. Paramedic programs that are not accredited may also be authorized by states and territories. Some states maintain EMS professional levels um, other than those identified for the national scope of practice. Those are all givens. So at this point, there's no get national uh, mechanism for tracking EMS education programs that aren't accredited. So that means there's no data, uh, nationally available data to support workforce uh, entry insufficiencies. Um, we think consistent national reporting of initial education programs could potentially help for recruitment efforts. So those are some of the suggestions that the subgroup is making for uh, tasks for us or uh, collaboration tasks for us moving forward from um, the information presented thus far. Next slide. The National Registry was kind enough to provide some information to us. Um, they've let us know um, their uh, registration numbers or certification numbers uh, beginning in uh, 2020, essentially whenever the pandemic started and through uh, December 1st of this year. If you'll know, we've seen an increase of about 50,000 um, providers or EMS uh, practitioners uh, in 
during the pandemic. Much of those being EMT with a pretty consistent number uh, with obvious increases, but a pretty consistent number in paramedics. Next slide. For recertification, it looks like it's somewhere between uh, 30 and 40% of folks don't recertify. Now, this number doesn't show whether they are not recertifying after having been certified for so many year, uh, cycles and decided, you know what, I've had enough. I'm not going to recertify anymore. I'm just going to stick with what, what's, what's going on at my state level. Or is it just folks that do, do their initial education, become certified, and drop it after their first cycle because they aren't required to by the state that they're in? Next slide. Um, I guess I mean that a little too much information on that slide. So certification, information provided by the National Register suggests that the number of uh, certified EMS professionals increasing, yet shortages still continue to be recorded. Reported. We're kind of interested to know why that's happening. As far as recertification goes, does a low frequency of recertification suggest EMS professionals are leaving EMS? Or does it suggest EMS professionals don't ascribe value to recertification because their states don't require it? And if neither is applicable, how can we decide what is? Moving on to the next slide, please. So CAPSI's provided some information for us. I wanted to put this out there for the FICOMS uh, folks to, to be aware of. Fi um, CAPSI is the Commission on Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continuing Continuing Education. Those of you who've been in the biz for a while, you probably knew that them as C-Speams or cat beams, depending on where you're from um, in the past, but they, they changed their name and they're now the Commission on the Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continuing Education. They have a mobile app. Uh, anytime you finish a com course completion, you can upload it into their database in real time. Once it's uploaded in the database, you can send those records to the state. Those, those records can be forwarded to the state office or EMS office in your state or uh, the national registry. Next slide. CAPSI has worked with the national registry uh, to integrate NIMSID numbers. NIMSID numbers are the national EMS identification numbers. Those are 12 digit, well, unique 12 digit numbers that national registries come up with to identify providers and to identify students who are coming into the field or, or into the profession. It's important to have that to be able to identify uh, in whatever EMS capacity that could potentially exist. The National Registry can now query records in the CAPSI database based on the NIMSID number that they provided CAPSI. Just so you know, there are about 18.9 record, million records in the CAPSI database at this point. Next slide, please. State licensing only records. CAPSI and registry uh, have amended their data sharing records or agreements to in include state licensing only records, uh, specifically for practitioners from Utah, Arkansas, West Virginia, and Massachusetts. They're also working on agreements that would modify the process with Kansas and Virginia. This will be important later in the presentation. Next slide. There's a new upload process. They used to use the XML. Um, this is extensive markup language. I had to look that up. Um, that was a problematic um, file for uploading. So they switched over to comma separated value files. Apparently those are easy to upload, take less time, and it simplifies course completion. Next slide. They've got a duplicate filter now so the submitters can, can avoid putting in uh, duplicate information. And this also helps with user fraud, preventing it. Next slide. Hey, did you know that Matt Capsi got published back last in, um, you know, in excuse me, in pre-hospital emergency care, they had a manuscript accepted for publication. It was the effects of COVID-19 on EMS uh, refresher course uh, completion and delivery. Next slide. So projects they're working on in the future. Uh, first forward resilience microlearning. They're trying to figure out how microlearning applications can equate to continuing education units. They're doing research of that now, and they're hoping to be able to start doing some analysis at the end of the year. The continued competency project is something the National Registry is working on, and 
CAPSI as well as other uh, national organizations are working with the National Registry to improve continued competency within the next couple of years. The universal real-time reporting, they're working to improve their app essentially. Um, and the accreditation uh, manual, they're for continuing education programs, they're doing um, an update on that and it should be available after the first of the year. Next slide. So questions from the for information that I presented earlier. That unique identifier for EMS providers, that NIMSID number, it could create an ability to gather EMS uh, data on EMS professionals from cradle to grave. Could it be used as a source for professional entry and exit data? Could it be used with, with recruitment and retention? Could it be used to identify those using uh, the profession as a career builder? And if they are, can we research why the individuals lead the profession? Could it be used to create personalized continuing education plans? Uh, as far as the um, SLO, the state licensing only data, could this be a mechanism by which states uh, collect uh, information on state credentialed EMS providers and those that are not registered by the National Registry? Just some questions. Next slide. So the National Association of EM, uh, EMTs provided some information. Uh, they were established back in 80, uh, 75. They've got about 7,500 members at this point. One of the key things that they do for EMS practitioners is provides access to quality, high, uh, quality education. Uh, those are their words, uh, my, not my endorsement. Next slide. Uh, one of their missions is to provide evidence-based education that's cost-effective and uh, high quality and hopes that that high quality education will make mean for high quality patient care. All their courses are put together by subject matter experts in pre-hospital care uh, internationally. Next slide. These are the courses that they offer. Next slide. And here's the patches for the courses they offer. Uh, they wanted you to know that the, in, back up one, I'm not done. Uh, it's a global uh, leader in EMS education. And did you know about 130,000 students touch in AEMT over 80, 80 countries worldwide? Okay, now you can go. This is delivery methods and uh, critical thinking uh, mechanisms that they use to get through the, the courses. Next slide. How, how many kids have they taught, or excuse me, how many students have they taught um, Present here, there's a trend over the last four couple of years. Uh, courses taught and students taught. Next slide. And their outreach globally. Next slide. So, continuing education programs and research. Could course petition, course petition, I'm gonna try that word one more time. Course participation outcome data be used to collect to collect, be collected and used for federal collaborations for developing and improving all the sub uh, group, um, members of the technical working group, all their objectives. Just kind of curious. Next slide. Ms. Enzo, this is whenever you've graduated from paramedic school, been practicing a while, and then you've gone and moved on to the state office and you're a state office official now and you're, um, they wanted you to know uh, their Council of State Office officials has finally decided, their board uh, voted to elevate the Education uh, Committee to an Education Council. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, the Council differs from a committee because they represent major efforts of state office EMS officials, uh, such as licensing of personnel, trauma systems, and data management. Council members were appointed uh, by the state EMS director Council chair is a voting member of the board and councils are required to develop a work plan for um, report pr progress. Next slide. The CIMSO wanted you also to know that they're working with an office of EMS uh, with, on a cooperative agreement to do workforce studies um, and develop recommendations for future efforts. During the early stages of this project, they found out some, there's some significant data gaps in EMS education. I want to be able to find out what is the productivity level of EMS education programs? Are EMS education programs effective in meeting the current demands? And are there 
the reasonable expectations for performance measures for EMS education programs, what are they? Um, and at what rate is appropriate for EMS education uh, programs to push quality students through in order to meet the workforce demands? Next slide. Yeah, we made it to the end. If you have questions about anything that we presented today from our, our subgroup, please reach out to us. We'll be able to give you information um, from any of the providers or the stakeholder, stakeholder organizations that provided information today. Apologies for the long presentation, but I did want to provide everything uh, that would potentially become the MS Education Dashboard for PICOMS in the, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Claire. I appreciate the brief and thanks to all those that briefed out on the subgroup activities. It's now time for a 10 minute recess and uh, according to my clock, it is right at the top of the hour. Um, so we'll reconvene 10 minutes from now, uh, 310 Eastern. Thank you. Welcome back everyone from break. We'll now hear updates from the National EMS Advisory Council. Chairperson Mary Ehlers will provide the update. Her proxy is Vice Chairman Jonathan Washko. Thank you, Chair Green. My name is Mary Ehlers. I currently represent the EMS education sector, serve as the NEMSEC chair, and would like to offer the following update for you today. The National EMS Advisory Council was established in 2007 as a national recognized council of EMS representatives and consumers to provide advice and recommendations regarding EMS to NETSA and to the members of NEMSIS. NEMSEC provides a forum for development, consideration, and communication of information from a knowledgeable and independent perspective. NEMSEC does not exercise program management or regulatory development responsibilities and makes no decision directly affecting the programs on which it provides advice. NEMSEC charter is due to expire at the end of April in 2023. The net the NETSA Office of EMS has taken action to renew the charter. The charter renewal request is currently under review by the Office of the Secretary of Transportation. NENSEC is comprised of 25 representatives. With active involvement, representatives may be considered to serve for no more than two terms. With that said, in the spring of 23, we will have 20 sectors open for new representation. EMS educators, EMS quality improvement, volunteer EMS, state EMS directors, EMS medical directors, emergency physicians, pediatric emergency physicians, PSAP call takers, dispatchers, emergency nurses, emergency management, air medical, and state highway safety. The solicitation period for applicants ended on November 10th of 2022. 56 applicants requesting to fill these 12 sectors. The NEMSEC selection panel has been reconstituted and the application packets are currently under review. From these applicants, names of nominees and names of alternatives will be selected and forward to the Office of the Secretary for appointment as a government representative for NEMSEC. The 2022 NEMSEC met four times. March and May meetings were held virtual. The August and November meetings were held in Washington, D.C. with simcasted via WebEx platform. The August meeting was the first time NEMSEC met in person since January of 2020. In 2023, NEMSEC is scheduled to meet four times. Tentative dates are February 15, 16, May 10th and 11th, August 9th and 10th, and November 8th and 9th. A notice in the Federal Register will solidify each meeting date. The Council is subdivided into six standing committees integration and technology, preparedness and education, equitable patient care, sustainability and efficiency, adaptability and innovation, and professional safety. Subcommittees met monthly to discuss advisory research findings and make edit documents to be presented to the Council for review and approval as a draft advisory. 
when draft advisories are finalized, they are forwarded as advice and recommendations to the Secretary of Transportation and FICOMS through the NETSA Federal Designated Officer. The following advisories, I'm happy to report, were finalized in 2022. Reducing social inequities in EMS through a national out-of-hospital cardiac arrest registry, the EMS Bill of Rights, strengthening emergency medical services and hospital relationships to improve efficiency and positively impacting patient outcomes, cybersecurity, what to do when technology fails and how to mediate in a proactive way, the ad hoc NRSS and guideline subcommittee also presented two letters to the council for approval. One letter was to NETSA offering advice about how the national roadway safety strategy post crash care could be improved nationwide. The other letter addressed to FICOMS requesting support for the dissemination and implementation of EMS model clinical guidelines and the field triage guidelines to identify a mechanism for funding future additions of these guidelines. The following advisory topics are scheduled to move forward to maturation in 2023. The strategy to mitigate negative impacts to EMS well-being during public health emergencies by recognizing EMS practitioners as an essential healthcare worker, as well as identifying the term pre-hospital as a healthcare setting. Equitable access to EMS regardless of population density, ensuring optimal emergency response via a fully integrated 911 and emergency medical dispatch system, ambulance crash data and analysis, EMS system performance-based funding and reimbursement model, designation of graduate prepared paramedics as a federal recognized practitioner, large scale incidents, EMS planning and preparedness, crash scene safety for EMS responders. Mr. Chair, this concludes the report for FICOMS from the National EMS Advisory Council. I yield the floor back to you, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson Ehlers, for the NEMSAC update. Now we come to the part of our meeting where we hear more about some innovations occurring in EMS patient care settings. Today we have speakers from the San Antonio, Texas Fire Department EMS and the National EMS for Children's Innovation and Improvement Center, which is housed in FERSA. We will hear about the whole blood program at San Antonio EMS first. Dr. Winkler and Lieutenant Bullock, please introduce yourselves and go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Chairman Green. This is CJ Winkler, Deputy Medical Director for San Antonio Fire Department. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is William Bullock, Lieutenant uh, EMS Program Lead, San Antonio Fire Department. Well, thank you for inviting us, Chairman Green. So we're we don't have any specific asks. We are sharing what we think is best practice, and if some asks come out of that, please feel free, I think, at the end of the meeting. So we have a pre-hospital whole blood program here in South Texas that covers 22 county area, which means that we can get in the field environment blood to any patient in hemorrhagic shock, whether that's trauma or medical patient. I have a lot of, a lot of hats I wear, but I think the short of it is that whether it's a metropolitan suburban, rural, or a disaster agency that I am medical director for, I believe the best practice is a balanced base blood resuscitation for those in hemorrhagic shock. Uh, next slide, please. So we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just reviving an old practice. Um, this is part of what um, helped San Antonio Fire Department receive the EMS service of the year a few years ago with uh, Lieutenant Bullock on the cover of that. We'll talk about that program now. Next slide, please. So we, this, the reason we, part of the reason we developed this program is I'm medical director for Wilson County ESD3, which includes Sutherland Springs. We had a mass uh, fatality there and the Asper Tracy put out a publication that said they felt that metropolitan cities have 
my words, maybe not exactly theirs, but have a responsibility to provide people, equipment, and blood during these mass casualty shootings to rural settings. We took that to heart and we developed a whole blood program here. Next slide, please. So, like I said, we're not invent, reinventing the wheel. We are borrowing heavily from the military. Um, next slide. That article you just saw, the preface says, the reason that fatalities reduced in World War, in the Korean War from World War I and World War II is that whole blood and plasma were available to soldiers and troops. Next slide. So, um, it's not bragging if it's true. I'm very proud of San Antonio Fire Department and UT Health. We work together to deploy whole blood to every patient that needs it in San Antonio. And we just, in October 1st, 2018, we just transfused our thousandth unit of pre-hospital whole blood uh, in September of this year. Next slide, please. Uh, that didn't happen alone. That I think it was said earlier, the NIMSAC Rex by uh, Ann Carlson, that it's all about collaboration and that's the truth. So real quick, how we did, how we got this program off the ground, the San Antonio Medical Foundation um, gave an initial funding uh, of $150,000 to South Texas Blood and Tissue Center to build a whole blood supply. Then um, University Health System, which is our level one trauma center, agreed to uh, take that blood if San Antonio Fire Department did not use it on patients. I'll explain that a little bit more later, but uh, I do have to say STRAC was, was very helpful, our regional advisory council in Texas and the city of San Antonio and Chief Hood to make that possible. Next slide, please. So what did we do? My office and San Antonio Fire Department, first we wrote a position statement, seems very basic, but I, you know, as a paramedic myself that became an ER doctor and an EMS doctor, I truly believe that we need to bring, you know, the emergency room to the patient's side, whether it's in a car wreck, um, whether that's off in the woods where they're hurt and they're bleeding, we need to be able to get that treatment that you get in the ER to the patient's side. So we wrote a statement saying that we believe in a balanced blood-based resuscitation or whole blood to the patient in hemorrhagic shock. Next slide. So um, gratuitous self-promotion of my uh, participation in the Brothers in Arms program. Sorry about that. But we basically have a program. We, we have a very solid donor base of low titer O positive whole blood. I'm very proud to say um, next year uh, females will be allowed to donate as well. So we'll obviously have to change our name. And this is a group of donors that in a mass cow can form a walking blood bank and go to our local HEB, which is our grocery store, and donate blood in an emergency situation. We can talk more about that in a moment. Next slide, please. So I believe in whole blood for medical patients. This is our clinical operating guidelines for available for free on the internet um, for San Antonio Fire. Next slide, please. Whole blood for trauma patients. Next slide, please. And whole blood for pediatric patients, there are pretty much no contraindications except for religious objection. If someone is bleeding, we will give them blood just like they were in the would in the hospital. Next slide, please. This is a little bit of how we get it done. Um, this is what Lieutenant Bullock does every day. That's probably him in the picture. Um, we basically keep our blood cold with two coolers, a very efficient, program uh, system, if you will, that we borrowed from the military. And our blood stays at about four degrees Celsius all day long. We have a temp monitoring device there in the green circle and wireless temp. We know if any blood goes out of above five or six degrees, we'll, the entire system gets an alert immediately. Next slide, please. So one of the difficulties, and I'll talk more about this, is that EMS physicians and EMS on the left there um, versus uh, tradition of uh, EMS, or excuse me, of blood bank on the right there. And that has been really the best part of our program is, is me and other EMS docs uh, and trauma surgeons getting to work with our pathologists to save lives. It's, it's really been special. I don't have time to talk about it now, but ask me offline and I'll, I'll tell you just how great our partners have been that are pathologists. Next slide, please. 
So communication, we have, we have a quarterly meeting in the region. Um, this is the old group me that we knew where blood was on every ambulance. Those are all ambulances and hospitals where we have full blood. And then uh, we had a card that the medics could uh, give to the hospital if a provider had not heard of our whole blood program. Next slide. So we have a triplicate form um, that we fill out. One goes to EMS, one goes to the ER, and one goes to the blood pathologist in the hospital, along with, if you see that finger pointing to those little segs or segments on the blood, so the pathologist knows that we gave the patient blood. Quick note, tell your new employees that triplicate form, you just have to fill the top one out. Press hard. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a very busy slide. Let me say that with South, without South Texas Blood and Tissue Center and as, or more importantly, University Hospital, um, we would not have the success we have. What basically happens at San Antonio Fire Department, we keep the blood on the ambulance for 14 days. If we don't transfuse the blood, we give it back to South Texas Blood and Tissue Center and they give it to University Hospital, our trauma center, and they'll transfuse it within a day or two in a trauma patient. That allows us to have a 0% waste rate. We don't waste any blood here. Absolutely no brothers in arms blood is wasted. Um, next slide. So we used to use paper, as I showed you a second ago in GroupMe. Now we have an app. That comes into play on the next slide. So we take a picture of the blood inventory. We know where every unit of blood is in our system, whether it's at the blood center, whether it's at University Hospital, or whether it's on an ambulance or a helicopter. This is San Antonio's um, uh, blood supply. Next slide. This is the regions. So you can see how many units we have on hand. This is every day, an app that is up, uploaded every day. Next slide. Um, we're going to talk a little bit here about the research. So as always, data metrics research are needed. This is one of the first articles to come out of San Antonio that says pre-hospital whole blood reduces early mortality in patients with hemorrhagic shock. Please use freely if you're trying to start a program and to convince people that this is a useful treatment. Next slide. So I think these big articles by Dr. Porter and uh, Dr. Cotton are fantastic comparing whole blood to component therapy in the hospital. Very big studies um, and basically say that whole blood is, is even superior to component therapy. Um, component therapy, of course, being red blood cells, platelets, and plasma broken up into their parts. Next slide. We have a MCI a whole blood push pack in the, reason, in the region, and we have 20 units of blood and five uh, QN flow warmers. And unfortunately, we have had to use the system. Next slide. So you value mass shooting. We had 20 units of whole blood on scene within 30 minutes. 17 units were on the helicopters. Three units were with ground EMS. We sent 20 units of blood to the local hospital. Um, 10 units of that was whole blood. 10 units of that was packed red blood cells, O negative. Um, we transfused uh, one unit of whole blood in the hospital and then one unit en route to the trauma center. Next slide, please. This is um, a video, we won't watch it here. If it does play, just click through. But um, basically there's a helicopter here, a landing pad at the blood center that when we have a mass cal, the helicopter will land. We put the blood units, the warmers, et cetera, in the helicopter. We also have a, a dual response system where an EMS supervisor for San Antonio Fire Department will take their ground vehicle and get blood to the scene as well. Next slide. And then some state difficulties, Texas, Florida versus Alabama, New Jersey. So scope of practice is easy in Texas and Florida. We have delegated EMS medical practices. So we don't have any of the difficulties that say um, New Jersey would with legislature um, approval or Alabama had to change state health services. I want to take a moment um, to talk about the three bullet points here in the SEMSO, TCCC, and TECCC. They all recommend whole blood, so thank you for that, for those folks that are on the call um, that have recommended whole blood uh, for shock and trauma, et cetera. That's extremely helpful. Next slide. Some, some other difficulties, um, sourcing and contracting. So I, I mentioned the South Texas story. Florida's story was that they had to cut through some red tape. Eventually, the process took two years. Um, and they launched over the summer. Next slide. 
cost, obviously a hurdle to EMS implementation, not just cost, but, but reimbursement um, or a funding source is needed. Next slide. Difficulties with hospital partners. Um, trauma surgeon resistance in Florida, it was a little difficult to convince our trauma surgery partners that, that this was a useful treatment um, pre-hospital for EMS. In San Antonio, we're lucky in Military City USA that um, trauma surgeons believe in this program because we have so many military trauma surgeons um, that retire here or continue to work here. And of course, we have the DOD's only level one trauma center that treats civilian patients. And then Austin has met some re resistance with their whole blood program and their trauma surgeons. Next slide. And then blood supplier difficulties. Concerns are this from the blood center. You know, they have to follow a lot of regulations and protocols. The pathologists have traditionally operated in safety first model and then Really, you just fix all this with the building of relationships. And I, I've personally found success when I just talk to the medical directors of the blood bank and talk to the um, directors of the blood bank and say, you know, we carry controlled substances. We have other medicines. We can be a good steward of this product. Next slide. And solutions, collaboration, speak the same language, um, research, grant funding, billing slash reimbursement slash funding, explain how EMS works to our blood pathology partners, and then um, standard of care slash scope of practice. You know, ask what the agency or institution believes is best practice and then discuss from there. Next slide. Um, Bill, I think I took uh, 12 minutes and I'm sorry if I didn't leave you, in but I will say anyone's uh, welcome to email me. One thing I didn't mention is that uh, Lieutenant Bullock and I, we host a Whole Blood Academy uh, once or twice a year. Feel free to email me and come down for a couple of days and we teach um, folks. We actually taught the Fort Leggett, uh, that was mentioned earlier, Fort Leggett Army EMS folks. Um, they came to the academy and then they deployed their Whole Blood shortly after that. Thank you for your time, Mr. Chairman. Um, Bill, I'm sorry, do you want to say hi and, and you actually do the work? I, I took up all your time. No problem, Dr. Winkler. I'll just add just one or two comments, um, but everything was was excellent. Uh, you know, our department lead, Chief Charles Hood, is dedicated to expanding this program to any agency uh, or organization that is interested in learning about it and implementing it. Uh, we are relentless with our pursuit of, of proliferating this program. Uh, as evidence, Dr. Winkler mentioned Palm Beach that we assisted. We've helped Oklahoma City. Uh, New Orleans, they've all got programs after consult with the San Antonio Fire Department. Um, but we are here for anyone that needs anything, and uh, we're happy to help. Thank you so much. Thank you, both Dr. Winkler and Lieutenant Bullock. Thank you for presenting to FICOMS today an outstanding brief and, and certainly a, a very successful program. Now it's time to hear a presentation about the pre-hospital pediatric readiness project from the National EMS for Children's Innovation and Improvement Center. Dr. Remick, please introduce yourself and proceed with your presentation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Remick. Uh, I am an EMS physician as well as a pediatric emergency medicine physician. Um, I'm just up the road from uh, Dr. Winkler and um, Chief Bullock, uh, where I um, am housed at the University of Texas in Austin. And I serve as co-director for the National EMS for Children Innovation and Improvement Center, uh, which is a federally funded program through HRSA uh, EMS for Children. If you could go to the next slide is just a brief uh, disclosure and acknowledgement of um, funding. I will also be talking about uh, some of the work from our sister center, the EMSE uh, Data Center, um, whose uh, grant award number is listed there. Uh, what I present today is not official views or representation, of course, of U.S. government, DHHS, or HRSA. Next slide, please. Um, what I will be speaking about today specifically is a little bit about the development of a program called the National Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Project. Um, I hope to share with you a little bit about the development of the assessment and where we are in terms of moving towards launching um, the Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Assessment. Next slide, please. As many of you are uh, acutely aware of the approximately 30 million EMS transports that have been reported in the NISMSO 2020 survey, we know that about 10% of patients are pediatric. Uh, what this translates to, unfortunately, is that many EMS agencies see fewer than eight children per month. 
And these are often uh, situations that cause high levels of anxiety due to um, uh, infrequent ongoing experience with critically ill and injured ch children. Many of you are aware of the Institute of Medicine report that came out in 2006 that cited some of the challenges and um, deficiencies that we are facing both in EMS, but also uh, the, the part growing pains for children. And what we know from this work and from other publications since then is that when it comes to pre-hospital care for children, there is significant variability in that care, uh, which has led to the creation of EMS affiliates within the Pediatric Emergency Care uh, Applied Research Network um, to help derive evidence. But even so, there's the variability when it comes to management of pain, uh, trauma, seizures, respiratory distress, et cetera. In fact, most providers do report that they see fewer than three pediatric patients in a given month. And we know that the challenges are not just related to knowledge and experience, but in many EMS agencies, there are gaps in pediatric protocols and certainly the adherence to evidence-based guidelines, um, gaps in pediatric equipment, um, gaps in ongoing uh, continuing education requirements, and um, sometimes inadequacies in uh, ongoing pediatric skills checks. Next slide, please. Um, in 2020, uh, there was published a national joint policy statement called Pediatric Readiness and Emergency Medical Services Systems. Um, this was jointly published by the organizational logos that you see um, on your screen. So the National Association of EMS Physicians, the National Association of EMTs, the Emergency Nurses Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the American College of Emergency Physicians. And in this joint policy statement and the accompanying technical report, these organizations um, collaboratively describe how EMS agencies uh, should ensure readiness to meet the needs of children. And in this report, there are, are seven uh, key domains that are outlined. Um, these include uh, education and provider competencies, which we've heard about today, um, ensuring interaction with systems of care that integrates the needs of children, um, ensuring the presence of pediatric equipment and supplies, uh, making sure that we integrate patient and family-centered care, ensuring there are processes in place uh, for pediatric patient safety, whether that means uh, weight-based estimations or taking care with um, uh, medication dosing, and finally, um, quality improvement, performance improvement efforts to understand how protocols and or guidelines are being integrated into the complex systems um, that we know to be our pre-hospital care systems. Next slide, please. Um, so we know that this has really led to um, a lot of insight into how we can make improvements um, in our pre-hospital care for children. Uh, what I'd like to highlight is that one of the calls to action within this report is the establishment of um, an individual called a pediatric emergency care coordinator or someone who can really serve to champion the needs of children within the pre-hospital um, or EMS agency. Um, you can see that from a 2015 NISMSA survey looking at a variety of, um, looking at all states, they were able to identify some specialty um, uh, credentials that are being recognized across states. These include air medical, community paramedicine, critical care, tactical wilderness, wildland fire, and then pediatrics. What I hope you'll realize is that there are very few states that currently recognize pediatrics as a key EMS specialty or a potential track uh, for advancement and career development. Uh, this is certainly a, a piece that was called out in the joint policy statement and is being endorsed by these national professional organizations as a means to ensure uh, pediatric readiness within those EMS agencies. Next slide, please. Um, our sister center, the EMS for Children Data Center, uh, conducts an annual survey of EMS agencies. This was a survey that went out in 2022 and the results of which I'd like to share with you. Um, the survey went out to approximately 17,000 uh, EMS agencies, uh, 8,350 that responded, representing 54 0.5% response rate. And they asked a series of questions related to pediatric pre-hospital care. 
The first of which to get it was to get a sense of uh, indeed the volume of children that are being seen by that agency. And what you'll see highlighted on the top of the screen is that over 80% of EMS agencies report seeing eight or fewer pediatric patients per month. That makes it extremely difficult to be able to maintain ongoing readiness for children. Um, there is, of course, some variability in terms of agency um, licensure level, whether it be BLS, ALS. I think this uh, is well representative of the national um, landscape of EMS agencies. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, uh, through this survey, they looked at the ways in which uh, we're checking uh, pediatric specific skills. And you'll see that about uh, two thirds of EMS agencies report requiring a demonstration of pediatric skills or utilizing simulation based observation. Um, about a third are using field observation to ensure pediatric skills checks. Um, What's important to recognize, though, is that the frequency of that skills checking or pediatric training related to skills is somewhat limited for the great majority of agencies, where we see that about 75% um, have no or limited training related to pediatric skills. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, in response to the survey, a question was asked as to whether there was a pediatric emergency care coordinator um, referencing back to uh, the advanced practice uh, uh, certification for pediatrics. And what we found is that about a third of EMS agencies have a pediatric emergency care coordinator. And I think this speaks to an opportunity um, for us to begin looking at how we can recognize these individuals more formally and potentially at the state level. What you'll also see, though, is that there are a number of agencies that plan to add a pediatric emergency care coordinator or are interested in doing so, and that represents approximately another one fifth of all EMS agencies. A large number, of course, do not yet have a pediatric emergency care coordinator, um, and that may be for a variety of reasons. One, not recognizing the benefit uh, could be lack of workforce um, and or training, um, a number of potential factors. But what we know is that when it comes to having a pediatric emergency care coordinator is that they really oversee a number of essential um, responsibilities that lead to overall pediatric readiness and improvements in readiness and care. And those include promoting continuing education opportunities for pediatrics. Uh, it includes making sure that there are pediatric uh, specific guidelines in our protocols uh, that are derived from evidence based uh, recommendations. Um, ensuring the availability of medications, equipment, and supplies, overseeing QI and PI activities, and then ensuring um, really just that the pediatric perspective is integrated throughout um, the system of care. Next slide, please. So all of this has really served as much of the foundation for what we call the National Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Project, um, as you've seen alluded to, this is a effort that has been undertaken now by about 25 national professional organizations, along with federal partners to uh, uh, implement efforts to ensure pediatric readiness of pre hospital systems. This really has taken the lead from the national pre uh, pediatric readiness project for which I've reported to this committee in the past. Um, the National Pediatric Readiness Project was focused specifically on emergency departments and how we improve readiness for children, um, also following on the heels of the Institute of Medicine report on the future of emergency care. This project mirrors that project in many ways in terms of creating a national environmental scan to understand uh, current deficiencies, developing resources and tools to support EMS agencies, and then taking a number of steps, quality improvement based steps, um, in addition to uh, educational steps to enhance um, pediatric readiness. What we've learned from the National Pediatric Readiness Project is that having a pediatric emergency care coordinator is associated with as much as a 20 point increase in overall readiness. And what we now know from the National Pediatric Readiness Project is that being pediatric ready is associated with as much as a fourfold decrease in mortality for ill and or injured children who present to the emergency department. And we have every reason to suspect that pediatric readiness in the EMS uh, uh, arena will also lead to improvements in quality of care uh, and decreases in mortality. 
What you'll see here on the screen is a, a snapshot of a toolkit that was developed in response to this work. Um, in addition to this uh, checklist is a, uh, a large number of resources that we call the Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Toolkit. Um, this is hosted on the EMSC Innovation and Improvement Center website um, and is openly accessible uh, uh, to any EMS agencies. Uh, the checklist should be used or could be used uh, to identify gaps in pediatric readiness. And then the rest of the toolkit can be used to uh, identify templates and other resources that can be available to help improve readiness. Next slide, please. Um, the checklist includes the core domains from the uh, joint policy statement on pediatric readiness and emergency medical services systems. Again, you'll see those listed here. What I'd like to emphasize is that this is not simply about having the equipment and medications in place, but it's about having an entire um, interactive system of care that was designed with the needs of children integrated into the, the larger system design. Uh, so you'll see all seven of those domains uh, listed here specifically. Next slide, please. So over the last uh, year, approximately, we have been working to develop a national pre-hospital pediatric readiness assessment. This would be much more comprehensive than the pre-hospital assessment that you saw uh, from our, our sister center, the MSC Data Center. Um, that was a shortened, uh, abbreviated version to look at some core measures and areas of focus. But this particular assessment will really look at all aspects of pediatric readiness and provide an opportunity for agencies to implement quality improvement efforts uh, to enhance their systems of care. Next slide, please. Um, this is the timeline for the development of the um, pre-hospital pediatric readiness uh, project and assessment. So, as I mentioned, the joint policy statement was published in January of 2020, and it was about that time that we brought together the National Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Project Steering Committee. The steering committee um, focused initially on developing the tools and resources to support EMS agencies by developing the checklist that I just shared and also developing a comprehensive toolkit to address all of the domains of readiness. Over the last year, we've been working hard to develop the um, actual assessment that aligns with the checklist and all of the elements that are um, described in the guidelines. We utilized a modified Delphi process uh, with the Pre-Hospital Pediatric Readiness Project Steering Committee to ensure that not only um, was there clarity of the questions, but also to weight those questions according to importance, scientific acceptability, and feasibility to implement. Uh, so in other words, a modified national quality form criteria. The assessment is now built and we've completed the weighting algorithm for that. We've also developed um, the questions that are necessary for what we call a gap analysis or a gap report. And this is really to make sure we adhere to uh, the true tenets of quality improvement, that we are designing this with the purposes of helping to support agencies to improve, not to create mandates or to make this punitive. And one of the most critical elements of that is to be able to reflect on your current state, identify gaps, and therefore make improvements. So the gap analysis is an individualized report that every single EMS agency will receive that includes um, a high level overview of all of the missed items or missing items, and also a score based on that weighted pediatric readiness algorithm, and then a comparison score benchmarking to other EMS agencies, both national and similar sized or uh, characteristics. We plan to launch this assessment in the spring of 2024, and it's been quite a lead up to that. Next slide, please. These are the domains of the pre-hospital pediatric readiness assessment. There are a number of questions, of course, throughout. In fact, um, there are approximately 100 questions within the pre-hospital pediatric readiness project assessment. And I, I have not listed the actual number of questions per domain, but you can see how the committee um, was able to walk through a process to create weighting for each of these various domains, the total of which adds up to 100. Demographic categories of, are, of course, not weighted or scored. Um, as part of this assessment. Next slide, please. Um, 
Before uh, we move forward to launching this in 2024, uh, we spent a lot of time looking at how um, how clear um, and uh, easy it is to access the assessment as well as um, the flow of it. So uh, in order to do this, we launched a small pilot. Um, we compiled agencies both from the steering committee and from the EMSC data center and based on prior participation in EMSC surveys. We sent um, a, a initial survey, draft survey, um, to approximately 25 agencies for piloting uh, so that they could give us feedback on um, what made sense, what didn't, and any changes that were necessary. Next slide, please. Um, this is a representation of the states and our territories that were involved in the pilot. So you can see there was a nice distribution across uh, the United States. Next slide, please. And there's also a very nice distribution in terms of the characteristics of the EMS agencies. Um, so the majority were ALS agencies, but a significant variability in terms of annual pediatric patient volume. We had some agencies that um, had strictly paid staff, others that had volunteers or paid and volunteer staff. And you see that the majority of agencies were fire-based, but a nice distribution across um, the gamut. Next slide, please. Uh, based on the feedback that we see, received from that, we made some minor modifications to the assessment, and we are currently working on the electronic build. There are three components to this. Uh, on the left, you'll see just converting the assessment into an online version. Uh, the second is developing the web-based interface so that any EMS agency can easily um, go to this website, identify their agency, and move through the assessment. And then immediately after taking assessment, those agencies will receive an electronic gap analysis report um, that's demonstrated here on the right-hand side of your screen. This process takes quite some time to do, and we want to make sure that uh, there aren't any technological issues. So we will be introducing a second pilot coming up in early 2023. Um, next slide, please. So I think this concludes um, uh, the crux of my presentation. Uh, we are planning to launch in the spring of 2024. Um, we plan to have a pilot of two states um, in the fall of 2023 into early 2024 um, to ensure that everything is working smoothly. Uh, we would love to um, request uh, FICOM support as we begin to roll this out in the future. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Emick. We appreciate you taking the time to present today to the FICOMS group. We've now Thank come you. to a point in our meeting where we hear feedback from the public. At each of our general meetings, we set a time aside time to hear directly from members of the public who may want to provide input about our ongoing or future programming. Your feedback and suggestions are important. Just as a reminder, if you'd like to submit feedback or ask questions right now, please use the chat feature tool at the bottom of your screen, just under the live stream of the meeting. We may not be able to address your comments during the meeting, but we will try to provide a written response and post it on FICOM's landing page of EMS.gov in the future. In addition to live questions, solicited feedback for the committee in advance of this meeting at FICOMS at DOT.gov. We have collected one comment in advance of this meeting, so we'll go ahead and hear that first. Clary, please read the comment we received in advance. Yes, sir. This stage and age, this day and age of EMS, we seem to have a lot of neat gadgets and tools for getting people to do preventative care. While these fancy things are fun, they are useless unless we have people there to use them. We need to shift our focus from bringing people into the business. Excuse me. We need to shift our focus into bringing people into the business, so we're able to effectively fulfill our original purpose of providing patients with quality health care and transport to the hospital. In my view, one of the biggest issues EMS is facing right now and in the foreseeable future is the inability to recruit new EMS professionals. I've been with the industry for 30 years, and I've watched as the numbers have dwindled year after year. Because we are the most poorly compensated component of the emergency medical system service system, we often do not have the attractive compensation packages our hospital or healthcare system counterparts have. 
This isn't to say money is the only reason we can't seem to recruit and retain. However, it is one of the main factors and hasn't really been considered until recently. This is my, hum my opinion. Our industry is dying. It seems that when we all get together on this issue at the local, state, and national level, we keep saying how we need to do something to recruit and retain, but it always just seems like a conversation. There's been real no, no real money or ideas behind it. And that comes from Bradley R. Phillips, the Assistant Chief at Ta Union Township Life Squad in West Milton, Ohio. Okay. And that's all for some in advance. Thanks, Larry. Thanks to Assistant Chief uh, Phillips for those comments. Um, I know there wasn't a question embedded in there. Um, I, I will say from my personal experience in managing EMS systems in, in the past life that um, attrition in the workforce and attracting quality people and retaining quality people has been and continues to be a challenge. Certainly, um, the industry and the profession face challenges moving forward, and it's my hope that uh, the folks on, on this call, including those members um, of FICOMS and the other agencies that we've heard from uh, and briefed out can be part of the solution. Um, and I certainly agree that more could and should be done. Uh, Gam, do you have any other comments from a, a NHTSA perspective that you'd like to add to the conversation? No, not at this time, Mr. Green. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we also have Mr. Uh, Dr. Richard Flyer, he's here to um, provide public comment and he's going to be doing that um, via this interface. Great. Dr. Flyer. Please go ahead. Uh, can you see me? Are you able no, to but see I can me? hear you. Uh, oh, okay, one second. I think that that should have taken care of it. Yep, there we go. First of all, um, the last speaker uh, addressed uh, the needs of children and the current uh, efforts to help children in the EMS systems. I'd just like to read a statement um, that sort of amplifies on that and which uh, comes from the perspective I have. Um, good afternoon, distinguished members of the Federal Interagency Council on Emergency Medical Services. Uh, my name is Richard Flyer. I went to Harvard Medical School and trained in pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Bronx Municipal Hospital Center, April of 80, after a short time as a fellow in pediatric pulmonology at Boston Children's Hospital, I founded a general pediatric practice in Northern New Jersey. I practiced there for almost 35 years in the towns where I was raised. On starting practice, it was immediately obvious to me that a really sick child in my otherwise privileged community could not be cared for properly. The pre-hospital care for children was chaotic, inappropriate, harmful, in short, a disaster. In the community hospital for our towns, those same descriptors were apt. It was clear that there was no system to care for our sickest children. By 1992, I had helped draft the nation's first EMS for Children law, garnered local and national media attention for the issue, and organized a coalition of parent and professional groups to gain passage of this historic statute. The law passed with virtually no opposition. The law says that it is, quote, the public policy of this state that children are entitled to comprehensive emergency medical services including pre-hospital, hospital, and rehabilitative care, unquote. In short, the children of New Jersey have a medical civil right to an EMS system that serves their unique medical, surgical, and psychiatric needs. Over the years, I have watched successive administrations deny New Jersey's children the care the law grants them. No statewide EMS system for children has been created in New Jersey or anywhere else in our country. In May 2021, the latest white paper on access to emergency medical care for children rated our country a D minus. And another recent consensus report stated that we need to, quote, 
optimize the safety of pediatric patients in the emergency care setting. In short, kids are currently and ever still in danger when they're most vulnerable and in need of life-saving care. And so I ask, why do we continue to fail our sickest children? Why can't we adapt and organize the individual elements of an EMS system to suit the unique needs of children? For example, why haven't we used telemedicine to systematically connect pre-hospital EMS providers in the field with pediatric emergency medicine physicians for medical control and triage? Why haven't we made certain that critically ill and injured children are, are only brought to centers that are going to provide them the expert care that they deserve? Why have we not told the public clearly about our ongoing failure to provide a seamless system of care for our sickest children in order to generate needed public interest and funding? Children represent approximately one fourth of our population or about 80 million human beings. They don't vote and they cannot advocate for themselves. They die quietly while their families want to believe that they've received adequate care. This illusion that our current EMS efforts function to care expertly for our sickest kids is just that, an illusion. And it is lethal for our children. I have been watching this painful failure for my entire medical career, and I beg you to help enact the change our nation's children deserve. Please join me in creating statewide EMS systems for children, and please do it with the urgency that our critically ill and injured children require. Please bring this message directly back to the secretaries of your departments, and please urge them to brief the president about our national failure to care for our sickest children. The time for action is now. Thank you for your attention and concern. Thank, thank you, Dr. Flyer, for that passionate and emotional statement. I don't know, Gam, if any of the FICOMS representatives is in a position to provide any comment, um, but we certainly appreciate the feedback and we will consider it thoughtfully. Yeah, Larry, I, don't do we have... We have any, I don't think we have any questions or comments from the FICOMS members. Uh, thank you, Dr. Flyer, for your statement. You're welcome. Larry, do we have any additional public comment? That concludes public comment, sir. Thank you, Larry. We've now come to the end of our period of public comment. Please remember that you can submit public feedback to FICOMS at any time via email. The email address is FICEMS, F-I-C-E-M-S, at DOT.gov. I will now open the floor for our roundtable discussion. Representatives, please feel free to elaborate on earlier updates or discuss new business with the FICEMS representatives. This time may also be used to communicate federal funding opportunities to the viewing public. Uh, Chairman Green, if I may go first for, uh, for NHTSA. Please do. Thank you, sir. Um, first off, I, I do want to uh, acknowledge a, a notice that went out from the U.S. Fire Administration earlier today. Um, a volunteer firefighter with the Mel Mapleton Fire Department in Mapleton, Pennsylvania, uh, lost his life in the line of duty uh, yesterday in a struck-by incident, Kurt Kilhoffer. Um, so, we want to extend, uh, I'm sure, on behalf of the entire NRNC, our sympathy uh, to the Kilhoffer family and uh, the Mapleton Fire Department on their loss. Um, I would just, you know, make a statement. We talked earlier about the National Roadway Safety Strategy and, and post-crash care. One of the priorities uh, in the National Roadway Safety Strategy is to improve on-scene safety for uh, police, fire, EMS, uh, tow operators, and everyone that operates on our nation's roadways. 
Um, Rick Patrick and I have had several discussions about the importance of, of eliminating uh, struck by fatalities and injuries on our nation's roadways. And clearly this remains an important uh, priority. Um, so do want to acknowledge uh, the loss of firefighter Kilhoffer. Um, two uh, other uh, just uh, kind of updates for the uh, for the committee. One, um, the technical working group um, staff are, are working on uh, developing a, a statement on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, we hope to have a draft for consideration uh, and review by the FICOMS members. Um, sometime in, in the new year. So I do, did want to make the members aware of that. And then um, uh, finally, uh, as we've heard in the, the, the update uh, from the NEMSAC, the, the National EMS Advisory Council did issue a letter to FICOMS on post-crash care, uh, specifically calling for in C support for uh, the American College of Surgeons Field Trauma Triage Guidelines and the NISEMSO model uh, clinical guidelines. Um, again, uh, two important initiatives that, uh, that FICOMS has supported in the past and that, ha that have been funded by NHTSA and our partners at HRSA EMS for children. So I, I think an important opportunity as we, uh, as federal partners, as we look at our own programs and the communications that we have with our uh, national, state, and local partners that we an important opportunity to get the word out about those uh, those important clinical guidelines. That's that's it for me, uh, Chairman Green, and I'm certainly happy to, uh, to hear any feedback or questions. Thanks, Cam. Any other FICOMS representative have any updates or new business to discuss or comments on on Cam's update? Giving the requisite amount of silence. All right, hearing none. Uh, we've come to the end of the allotted time for our FICOMS general meeting, so I'll close the roundtable discussions. Thank you all for those that provided federal program and project updates, and thank you to our special speakers from the San Antonio, Texas Fire Department, EMS, and the National EMS for Children's Innovation and Improvement Center. I would also like to thank the EMS and 911 communities that comprise our nation's emergency medical services system. Your continued commitment to the profession as clinicians, as well as your commitment to providing a valuable public service and help our citizenry is to be commended. Happiest of holidays to all and to all a good evening. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn the general FICOMS meeting. So move. Have a motion, will it be seconded? Seconded, seconded. Second, all of those in favor of adjourning this general FICOMS meeting, unmute and say aye. 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 Is there any opposition to adjournment? Voice vote, motion carries, and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>